Prologue Zeke and Zack huddled in the treehouse. Important business, any plots or plans, and all punishments for infractions of the rules were discussed in the sturdy wooden hideaway tucked in the branches of the dignified old sycamore. Today, a light rain tapped on the tin roof and dampened the dark green leaves. It was still warm enough in the first days of September that the boys wore T-shirts, red for Zeke, blue for Zack. They were twins, as identical as the sides of a two-headed coin. Their father had used the color code since their birth to avoid confusion. When they switched colors, as they often did, they could fool anyone in Taylor's Grove, except their father. He was on their minds at the moment. They had already discussed at length the anticipated delights and terrors of their first day in real school. The first day in first grade. They would ride the bus as they had done the year before in kindergarten, but this time they would stay in Taylor's Grove Elementary for a full day, just like the big kids. Their cousin Kim had told them that real school wasn't a playground. Zack, the more introspective of the two, had thought over, worried about, and dissected this problem for weeks. There were terrible, daunting terms like homework and class participation that Kim tossed around. They knew that she, a sophomore in high school, was often loaded down with books, big, thick books with no pictures. And sometimes when she was babysitting for them, she had her nose stuck in them for hours, for as long a time as she would have the telephone stuck to her ear, and that was long. It was pretty scary stuff for Zack, the champion warrior. Their father would help them, of course. This was something Zeke, the eternal optimist, had pointed out. Didn't they both know how to read stuff like Green Eggs and Ham and The Cat in the Hat because their dad helped them sound out the words? And they both knew how to write the whole alphabet and their names and short things because he showed them. The trouble was he had to work and take care of the house and them, as well as Commander Zark, the big yellow dog they'd saved from the animal shelter two years before. Their dad had, as Zack pointed out, an awful lot to do. And now that they were going to go to school and have assignments and projects and real report cards, he was going to need help. He's got Mrs. Hollis to come in once a week and do stuff. Zeke ran his miniature Corvette around the imaginary racetrack on the treehouse floor. It's not enough. A frown puckered Zack's forehead and clouded his late blue eyes. He exhaled with a long, suffering sigh, ruffling the dark hair that fell over his forehead. He needs the companionship of a good woman, and we need a mother's love. I heard Mrs. Hollis say so to Mr. Perkins at the post office. He hangs around with Aunt Mira sometimes. She's a good woman. But she doesn't live with us, and she doesn't have time to help us with science projects. Science projects were a particular terror for Zack. We need to find a mom. When Zeke only snorted, Zack narrowed his eyes. We're going to have to spell in first grade. Zeke caught his lower lip between his teeth. Spelling was his personal nightmare. How are we going to find one? Now Zack smiled. He had, in his slow, careful way, figured it all out. We're going to ask Santa Claus. He doesn't bring moms, Zeke said with the deep disdain that can only be felt by one sibling for another. He brings toys and stuff, and it's forever until Christmas anyway. No, it's not. Mrs. Hollis was bragging to Mr. Perkins how she already had half her Christmas shopping done. She said how looking ahead meant you could enjoy the holiday. Everybody enjoys Christmas. It's the best. Uh-uh. Lots of people get mad. Remember how we went to the mall last year with Aunt Mira, and she complained and complained about the crowds and the prices and how there weren't any parking spaces? Zeke merely shrugged. He didn't look back as often or as clearly as his twin, but he took Zack at his word. I guess. 
So if we ask now, Santa will have plenty of time to find the right mom. I still say he doesn't bring moms. Why not? If we really need one and we don't ask for too much else? We were going to ask for two wheelers, Zeke reminded him. We could still ask for them, Zack decided, but not a bunch of other things, just a mom and the bikes. It was Zeke's turn to sigh. He didn't care for the idea of giving up his big, long list, but the idea of a mother was beginning to appeal. They'd never had one, and the mystery of it attracted. So, what kind do we ask for? We gotta write it down. Zack took a notebook and a stubby pencil from the table pushed against the wall. They sat on the floor and, with much argument and discussion, composed. Dear Santa, we have been good. Zeke wanted to put in very good, but Zack, the conscience, rejected the idea. We feed Zark and help Dad. We want a mom for Christmas. A nice one who smells good and is not mean. She can smile a lot and have yellow hair. She has to like little boys and big dogs. She won't mind dirt and bakes cookies. We want a pretty one who is smart and helps us with homework. We will take good care of her. We want bikes, a red one and a blue one. You have lots of time to find the mom and make the bikes so you can enjoy the holidays. Thank you. Love, Zeke and Zack. Chapter 1 Taylor's Grove, population 2,340. No, 41, Nell thought smugly as she strolled into the high school auditorium. She'd only been in town for two months, but already she was feeling territorial. She loved the slow pace, the tidy yards and little shops. She loved the easy gossip of neighbors, the front porch swings, the frost-heaved sidewalks. If anyone had told her even a year before that she would be trading in Manhattan for a dot on the map in western Maryland, she would have thought them mad. But... Here she was, Taylor's Grove High's new music teacher, as snug and settled in as an old hound in front of a fire. She'd needed the change, that was certain. In the past year, she'd lost her roommate to marriage and inherited a staggering rent she simply wasn't able to manage on her own. The replacement roommate, whom Nell had carefully interviewed, had moved out as well, taking everything of value out of the apartment. That nasty little adventure had led to the final, even nastier showdown with her almost fiancé. When Bob berated her, called her stupid, naive, and careless, Nell had decided it was time to cut her losses. She'd hardly given Bob his walking papers when she received her own. The school, where she had taught for three years, was downsizing, as they had euphemistically put it. The position of music teacher had been eliminated. And so had Nell. An apartment she could no longer afford, all but empty, a fiancé who had considered her optimistic nature a liability, and the prospect of the unemployment line had taken the sheen off New York. Once Nell decided to move, she'd decided to move big. The idea of teaching in a small town had sprung up fully rooted. An inspiration, she thought now, for she already felt as if she'd lived here for years. Her rent was low enough that she could live alone and like it. Her apartment, the entire top floor of a remodeled old house, was a short, enjoyable walk from a campus that included elementary, middle, and high schools. Only two weeks after that first nervous day of school, she was feeling proprietary about her students and was looking forward to her first after-school session with her chorus. She was determined to create a holiday program that would knock the town's socks off. The battered piano was center stage. She walked to it and sat. Her students would be filing in shortly, but she had a moment. She limbered up her mind and her fingers with the blues, an old Muddy Waters tune. Old, scarred pianos were meant to play the blues, she thought, and enjoyed herself. Man, she's so cool. 
Holly Lindstrom murmured to Kim as they slipped into the rear of the auditorium. Yeah. Kim had a hand on the shoulder of each of her twin cousins, a firm grip that ordered quiet and promised reprisals. Old Mr. Stryker never played anything like that. And her clothes are so, like, now. Admiration and envy mixed as Holly scanned the pipe-stem pants, long overshirt, and short-striped vest Nell wore. I don't know why anybody from New York would come here. Did you see her earrings today? I bet she got them at some hot place on Fifth Avenue. Nell's jewelry had already become legendary among the female students. She wore the unique and the unusual. Her taste in clothes, her dark gold hair, which fell just short of her shoulders, and always seemed miraculously and expertly tousled, her quick, throaty laugh, and her lack of formality had already gone a long way toward endearing her to her students. She's got style, all right. But just then, Kim was more intrigued by the music than by the musician's wardrobe. Man, I wish I could play like that. Man, I wish I could look like that, Holly returned and giggled. Sensing an audience, Nell glanced back and grinned. Come on in, girls. Free concert. It sounds great, Miss Davis. With her grip firm on her two charges, Kim started down the sloping aisle toward the stage. What is it? Muddy waters. We'll have to shoehorn a little blues education into the curriculum. Sitting back, she studied the two sweet-faced boys on either side of Kim. There was a quick, odd surge of recognition that she didn't understand. Well, hi, guys. When they smiled back, identical dimples popped out on the left side of their mouths. Can you play chopsticks? Zeke wanted to know. Before Kim could express her humiliation at the question, Nell spun into a rousing rendition. How's that? she asked when she'd finished. That's neat! I'm sorry, Miss Davis. I'm kind of stuck with them for an hour. They're my cousins, Zeke and Zach Taylor. The Taylors of Taylor's Grove. Nell swiveled away from the piano. I bet you're brothers. I see a slight family resemblance. Both boys grinned and giggled. We're twins, Zach informed her. Really? Now, I bet I'm supposed to guess who's who. She came to the edge of the stage, sat and eyed the boys narrowly. They grinned back. Each had recently lost a left front tooth. Zeke, she said, pointing a finger, and Zack. Pleased and impressed, they nodded. How'd you know? It was pointless and hardly fun to mention that she'd had a 50-50 shot. Magic. Do you guys like to sing? Sort of. A little. Well, today you can listen. You can sit right in the front row and be our test audience. Thanks, Miss Davis, Kim murmured, and gave the boys a friendly shove toward the seats. They're pretty good most of the time. Stay, she ordered with an older cousin's absolute authority. Nell winked at the boys as she stood, then gestured to the other students filing in. Come on up. Let's get started. A lot of the business on stage seemed boring to the twins. There was just talking at first and confusion as sheet music was passed out and boys and girls were assigned positions. But Zack was watching Nell. She had pretty hair and nice big brown eyes. Like Zark's, he thought with deep affection. Her voice was kind of funny, sort of scratchy and deep but nice. Now and again, she looked back toward him and smiled. When she did, his heart acted strange, kind of beating hard like he'd been running. She turned to a group of girls and sang. It was a Christmas song, which made Zack's eyes widen. He wasn't sure of the name, something about a midnight clear, but he recognized it from the records his dad played around the holiday. A Christmas song, a Christmas wish. It's her, he hissed it to his brother, wrapping Zeke hard in the ribs. Who? It's the mom. Zeke stopped playing with the action figure he'd had stuck in his pocket and looked up on stage, where Nell was now directing the alto section. Kim's teacher is the mom? 
She has to be. Deadly excited, Zeke kept his voice in a conspiratorial whisper. Santa's had enough time to get the letter. She was singing a Christmas song, and she's got yellow hair and a nice smile. She likes little boys, too, I can tell. Maybe. Not quite convinced, Zeke studied Nell. She was pretty, he thought, and she laughed a lot even when some of the big kids made mistakes. But that didn't mean she liked dogs or baked cookies. We can't know for sure yet. Zack huffed out an impatient breath. She knew us. She knew which was which. Magic. His eyes were solemn as he looked at his brother. It's the mom. Magic, Zeke repeated and stared goggle-eyed at Nell. Do we have to wait till Christmas to get her? I guess so. Probably. That was a puzzle Zack would have to work on. When Mac Taylor pulled his pickup truck in front of the high school, his mind was on a dozen varied problems. What to fix the kids for dinner? How to deal with the flooring on his Meadow Street project? When to find a couple hours to drive to the mall and pick up new underwear for the boys? The last time he folded laundry, he'd noticed that most of what they had was doomed for the rag pile. He had to deal with a lumber delivery first thing in the morning and a pile of paperwork that night. And Zeke was nervous about his first spelling test, which was coming up in a few days. Pocketing his keys, Mac rolled his shoulders. He'd been swinging a hammer for the better part of eight hours. He didn't mind the aches. It was a good kind of fatigue, a kind that meant he'd accomplished something. His renovation of the house on Meadow Street was on schedule and on budget. Once it was done, he would have to decide whether to put it on the market or rent it. His accountant would try to decide for him, but Mac knew the final choice would remain in his own hands. That was the way he preferred it. As he strode from the parking lot to the high school, he looked around. His great-great-grandfather had founded the town, hardly more than a village back then, settled along Taylor's Creek and stretching over the rolling hills to Taylor's Meadow. There'd been no lack of ego in old Macaulay Taylor. But Mac had lived in D.C. for more than twelve years. It had been six years since he returned to Taylor's Grove, but he hadn't lost his pleasure or his pride in it. The simple appreciation for the hills and the trees and the shadows of the mountains in the distance. He didn't think he ever would. There was the faintest of chills in the air now, and a good strong breeze from the west. But they had yet to have a frost, and the leaves were still a deep summer green. The good weather made his life easier on a couple of levels. As long as it held, he'd be able to finish the outside work on his project in comfort, and the boys could enjoy the afternoons and evenings in the yard. There was a quick twinge of guilt as he pulled open the heavy doors and stepped into the school. His work had kept them stuck inside this afternoon. The coming of fall meant that his sister was diving headfirst into several of her community projects. He couldn't impose on her by asking her to watch the twins. Kim's after-school schedule was filling up, and he simply couldn't accept the idea of having his children becoming latchkey kids. Still, the solution had suited everyone. Kim would take the kids to her rehearsals, and he would save his sister a trip to school by picking them all up and driving them home. Kim would have a driver's license in a few more months, a fact she was reminding everyone about constantly. But he doubted he'd plunk his boys down in the car with his 16-year-old niece at the wheel, no matter how much he loved and trusted her. You coddle them. Mac rolled his eyes as his sister's voice played in his head. You can't always be mother and father to them, Mac. If you're not interested in finding a wife, then you'll have to learn to let go a little. Like hell he would, Mac thought. As he neared the auditorium, he heard the sound of young voices raised in song, subtle harmony, a good emotional sound that made him smile even before he recognized the tune, a Christmas hymn. It was odd to hear it now with the sweat from his day just drying on his back. He pulled open the auditorium doors and was flooded with it. Charmed, he stood at the back and looked out on the singers. One of the students played the piano. 
A pretty little thing, Mac mused, who looked up now and then, gesturing as if to urge her classmates to give more. He wondered where the music teacher was, then spotted his boys sitting in the front row. He walked quietly down the aisle, raising a hand when he saw Kim's eyes shift to his. He settled behind the boys and leaned forward. Pretty good show, huh? Dad! Zack nearly squealed, then remembered just in time to speak in a hissing whisper. It's Christmas. Sure sounds like it. How's Kim doing? She's real good. Zeke now considered himself an expert on choral arrangements. She's going to have a solo. No kidding. She got red in the face when Miss Davis asked her to sing by herself, but she did okay. Zeke was much more interested in Nell right then. She's pretty, isn't she? A little amazed at this announcement, the twins were fond of Kim but rarely complimentary, he nodded. Yeah, the prettiest girl in school. We could have her over for dinner sometime, Zack said slyly. Couldn't we? Baffled now, Mac ruffled his son's hair. You know Kim can come over whenever she wants. Not her. In a gesture that mimicked his father, Zack rolled his eyes. Jeez, Dad. Miss Davis. Who's Miss Davis? The ma... Zeke's announcement was cut off by his twin's elbow. The teacher, Zack finished with a snarling look at his brother. The pretty one. He pointed, and his father followed the direction to the piano. She's the teacher? Before Mac could reevaluate, the music flowed to a stop, and Nell rose. That was great, really. A very solid first run-through. She pushed her tousled hair back. But we need a lot of work. I'd like to schedule the next rehearsal for Monday after school. 3.45. There was already a great deal of movement and mumbling, so Nell pitched her voice to carry the rest of her instructions over the noise. Satisfied, she turned to smile at the twins and found herself grinning at an older and much more disturbing version of the Taylor twins. No doubt he was the father, Nell thought. The same thick, dark hair curled down over the collar of a grimy t-shirt. The same lake water eyes framed in long, dark lashes stared back at her. His face might lack the soft, slightly rounded appeal of his son's, but the more rugged version was just as attractive. He was long, rangy, with the kind of arms that looked tough without being obviously muscled. He was tanned and more than a little dirty. She wondered if he had a dimple at the left corner of his mouth when he smiled. Mr. Taylor? Rather than bother with the stairs, she hopped off the stage, as agile as any of her students. She held out a hand, decorated with rings. Miss Davis? He covered her hand with his calloused one, remembering too late that it was far from clean. I appreciate you letting the kids hang out while Kim rehearsed. No problem. I work better with an audience. Tilting her head, she looked down at the twins. Well, guys, how'd we do? It was really neat. This from Zeke. We like Christmas songs the best. Me too. Still flustered and flattered by the idea of having a solo, Kim joined them. Hi, Uncle Mac. I guess you met Miss Davis. Yeah. There wasn't much more to say. He still thought she looked too young to be a teacher. Not the teenager he'd taken her for, he realized. But that creamy, flawless skin and that tidy little frame were deceiving and very attractive. Your niece is very talented. In a natural movement, Nell wrapped an arm around Kim's shoulders. She has a wonderful voice and a quick understanding of what the music means. I'm delighted to have her. We like her too, Max said as Kim flushed. Zack shifted from foot to foot. They weren't supposed to be talking about dumb old Kim. Maybe you could come visit us sometime, Miss Davis, he piped up. We live in the big brown house out on Mountain View Road. That'd be nice. But Nell noted that Zack's father didn't second the invitation or look particularly pleased by it. And you guys are welcome to be our audience any time. You work on that solo, Kim. 
I will, Miss Davis. Thanks. Nice to have met you, Mr. Taylor. As he mumbled a response, Nell hopped back on stage to gather her sheet music. It was too bad, she thought, that the father lacked the outgoing charm and friendliness of his sons. Chapter 2 It didn't get much better than a drive in the country on a balmy fall afternoon. Nell remembered how she used to spend a free Saturday in New York. A little shopping, she supposed if she missed anything about Manhattan it was the shopping. Maybe a walk in the park. Never a jog. Nell didn't believe in running if walking would get you to the same place. And driving, well, that was even better. She hadn't realized what a pleasure it was to not only own a car, but be able to zip it along winding country roads with the windows open and the radio blaring. The leaves were beginning to turn now as September hit its stride. Blushes of color competed with the green. On one particular road that she turned down out of impulse, the big trees arched over the asphalt, a spectacular canopy that let light flicker and flit through as the road followed the snaking trail of a rushing creek. It wasn't until she glanced up at a road sign that she realized she was on Mountain View. The big brown house, Zack had said, she remembered. There weren't a lot of houses here two miles outside of town, but she caught glimpses of some through the shading trees. Brown ones, white ones, blue ones, some close to the creek bed, others high atop narrow, pitted lanes that served as driveways. A lovely place to live, she thought, and to raise children. However taciturn and stiff Mac Taylor might have been, he'd done a wonderful job with his sons. She already knew he'd done the job alone. It hadn't taken long for Nell to understand the rhythm of small towns. A comment here, a casual question there, and she'd had what amounted to a full biography of the Taylor men. Mac had lived in Washington, D.C. since his family moved out of town when he was a young teenager. Six years ago, twin infants in tow, he'd moved back. His older sister had gone to a local college and married a town boy and settled in Taylor's Grove years before. It was she, the consensus was, who had urged him to come back and raise his children there when his wife took off. Left the poor little infants high and dry, Mrs. Hollis had told Nell over the bread rack at the general store. Run off with barely a word and hadn't said a peep since. And young Macaulay Taylor had been mother and father both to his twins ever since. Maybe, Nell thought cynically, just maybe, if he'd actually talked to his wife now and again, she'd have stayed with him. Not fair, she thought. There was no decent excuse she could think of for a mother deserting her infant children, then not contacting them for six years. Whatever kind of husband Mac Taylor had been, the children deserved better. She thought of them now, those impish mirror images. She'd always been fond of children, and the Taylor twins were a double dose of enjoyment. She'd gotten quite a kick out of having them in the audience once or twice a week during rehearsals. Zeke had even shown her his very first spelling test with its big silver star. If he hadn't missed just one word, he'd told her, he'd have gotten a gold one. Nor had she missed the shy looks Zack sent her or the quick smiles before he flushed and lowered his eyes. It was very sweet to be responsible for his first case of puppy love. She sighed with pleasure as the car burst out from under the canopy of trees and into the light. Here were the mountains that gave the road its name, streaking suddenly into the vivid blue sky. The road curved and snaked, but they were always there, dark, distant, and dramatic. The land rose on either side of the road in rolling hills and rocky outcroppings. She slowed when she spotted a house on the crest of a hill. Brown, probably cedar, she thought, with a stone foundation and what seemed like acres of sparkling glass. There was a deck stretched across the second story, and there were trees that shaded and sheltered. A tire swing hung from one. She wondered if this was, indeed, the Taylor house. She hoped her new little friends lived in such a solid, well-planned home. 
Then she passed the mailbox planted at the side of the road just at the edge of the long lane. M. Taylor and Sons. It made her smile. Pleased, she punched the gas pedal and was baffled when the car bucked and stuttered. What's the problem here? She muttered, easing off on the pedal and punching it again. This time the car shuddered and stopped dead. For heaven's sake. Only mildly annoyed, she started to turn the key to start it again and glanced at the dash. The little gas pump beside the gauge was brightly lit. Stupid! she said aloud, berating herself. Stupid, stupid! Weren't you supposed to get gas before you left town? She sat back, sighed. She'd meant to, really, just as she'd meant to stop and fill up the day before, right after class. Now she was two miles out of town without even fumes to ride on. Blowing the hair out of her eyes, she looked out at the home of M. Taylor and Sons. A quarter-mile hike, she estimated which made it a lot better than two miles. And she had, more or less, been invited. She grabbed her keys and started up the lane. She was no more than halfway when the boys spotted her. They came racing down the rocky, pitted lane at a speed that stopped her heart. Sure-footed as young goats, they streaked toward her. Coming up behind was a huge yellow dog. Miss Davis! Hi, Miss Davis! Did you come to see us? Sort of. Laughing, she crouched down to give them both a hug and caught the faint scent of chocolate. Before she could comment, the dog decided he wanted in on the action. He was restrained enough to plant his huge paws on her thighs rather than her shoulders. Zack held his breath, then let it out when she chuckled and bent down to rub Zark on head and shoulders. You're a big one, aren't you? A big beauty! Zark lapped her hand in perfect agreement. Nell caught a look exchanged quickly between the twins, one that seemed both smug and excited. You like dogs? Zeke asked. Sure I do. Maybe I'll get one now. I never had the heart to lock one up in a New York apartment. She only laughed again when Zark sat and politely lifted a paw. Too late for formalities now, buddy, she told him, but shook it anyway. I was out driving, and I ran out of gas right smack at the bottom of your lane. Isn't that funny? Zack's grin nearly split his face. She liked dogs. She'd stopped right at their house. It was more magic. He was sure of it. Dad'll fix it. He can fix anything. Confident now that he had her on his own ground, Zack took her hand. Not to be outdone, Zeke clasped the other. Dad's out back in the shop building a rondack chair. A rocking chair? Nell suggested. Nah, a rondack chair. Come see. They hauled her around the house, past a curving sunroom that caught the southern light. There was another deck in the back, with steps leading down to a flagstone patio. The shop in the backyard, the same cedar as the house, looked big enough to hold a family of four. Nell heard the thwack of a hammer on wood. Bursting with excitement, Zeke raced through the shop door. Dad! Dad, guess what? I guess you've taken another five years off my life. Nell heard Mac's voice, deep and amused and tolerant, and found herself hesitating. I hate to bother him when he's busy, she said to Zeke. Maybe I can just call the station in town. It's okay, come on. Zack dragged her a few more feet into the doorway. See? Zeke said importantly, she came. Yeah, I see. Caught off balance by the unexpected visit, Max set his hammer down on his workbench. He pushed up the brim of his cap and frowned without really meaning to. Miss Davis? I'm sorry to bother you, Mr. Taylor, she began, then saw the project he was working on. An Adirondack chair, she murmured and grinned. A Rondack chair. It's nice. Will be. Was he supposed to offer her coffee, he wondered? A tour of the house? What? She shouldn't be pretty, he thought irrelevantly. There was nothing particularly striking about her. Well, maybe the eyes. They were so big and brown. 
but the rest really was ordinary. It must be the way it was put together, he decided, that made it extraordinary. Not certain whether she was amused or uncomfortable at the way he was staring at her, Nell launched into her explanation. I was out driving, partly for the pleasure of it and partly to try to familiarize myself with the area. I've only lived here a couple months. Is that right? Miss Davis is from New York City, Dad, Zack reminded him. Kim told you. Yeah, she did. He picked up his hammer again, set it down. Nice day for a drive. I thought so. So nice I forgot to get gas before I left town. I ran out at the bottom of your lane. A flicker of suspicion darkened his eyes. That's handy. Not especially. Her voice, though still friendly, had cooled. If I could use your phone to call the station in town, I'd appreciate it. I've got gas, he muttered. See, I told you Dad could fix it, Zack said proudly. We've got brownies, he added, struggling madly for a way to get her to stay longer. Dad made them. You can have one. I thought I smelled chocolate. She scooped Zack up and sniffed his face. I've got a real nose for it. Moving on instinct, Mac plucked Zack out of her arms. You guys go get some brownies. We'll get the gas. Okay. They raced off together. I wasn't going to abduct him, Mr. Taylor. Didn't say you were. He walked to the doorway, glanced back. The gas is in the shed. Lips pursed, she followed him out. Were you traumatized by a teacher at an impressionable age, Mr. Taylor? Mac. Just Mac. No, why? I wondered if we have a personal or a professional problem here. I don't have a problem. He stopped at the small shed where he kept his lawnmower and garden tools, then said, Funny how the kids told you where we lived and you ran out of gas right here. She took a long breath, studying him as he bent over to pick up a can, straighten, and turn. Look, I'm no happier about it than you, and after this reception, probably a lot less happy. It happens that this is the first car I've ever owned, and I'm still a little rough on the finer points. I ran out of gas last month in front of the general store. You're welcome to check. He shrugged, feeling stupid and unnecessarily prickly. Sorry. Forget it. If you'll give me the can, I'll use what I need to get back to town, then I'll have it filled and returned. I'll take care of it, he muttered. I don't want to put you out. She reached for the can, and that started a quick tug of war. After a moment, the dimple at the corner of his mouth winked. I'm bigger than you. She stepped back and blew the hair out of her eyes. Fine, go be a man, then. Scowling, she followed him around the house, then tried to fight off her foul mood as the twins came racing up. They each held a paper towel loaded with brownies. Dad makes the best brownies in the whole world, Zack told her, holding up his offering. Nell took one and bit in. You may be right, she was forced to admit, her mouth full. And I know my brownies. Can you make cookies? Zeke wanted to know. I happen to be known far and wide for my chocolate chip. Her smile became puzzled as the boys eyed each other and nodded. You come visit me sometime and we'll whip some up. Where do you live? Since his father wasn't paying close attention, Zeke stuffed an entire brownie in his mouth. On Market Street, right off the square, the old brick house with the three porches, I rent the top floor. Dad owns that, Zeke told her. He bought it and fixed it all up, and now he rents it out. We're in real estate. Oh. She let out a long breath. Really? Her rent checks were mailed to Taylor Management on Mountain View Road. So you live in our house, Zack finished up, in a manner of speaking. The place okay with you? Mac asked. Yes, it's fine. I'm very comfortable there. It's convenient to school. Dad buys houses and fixes them up all the time. Zeke wondered if he could get away with another brownie. He likes to fix stuff. 
It was obvious from the tidy and thoughtful renovation of the old house she now lived in that their father fixed them very well. You're a carpenter, then? she asked, reluctantly addressing Mac. Sometimes. They'd reached her car. Mac merely jerked his thumb to signal the boys and dog to keep off the road. He unscrewed the gas cap and spoke without looking around. If you eat another one of those, Zeke, I'm going to have to have your stomach pumped. Sheepishly, Zeke replaced the brownie on the paper towel. Excellent radar, Nell commented, leaning on the car as Mac added the gas. Goes with the territory. He looked at her then. Her hair was windblown and gilded by the sun. Her face was rosy from the walk and the breeze. He didn't like what looking at her did to his pulse rate. Why Taylor's Grove? It's a long way from New York. That's why. I wanted a change. She breathed deep as she looked around at rock and tree and hill. I got one. Pretty slow compared to what you'd be used to. Slow's something I do very well. He only shrugged. He suspected she'd be bored senseless in six months and heading out. Kim's pretty excited about your class. She talks about it almost as much as she does getting her driver's license. That's quite a compliment. It's a good school. Not all of my students are as cooperative as Kim, but I like a challenge. I'm going to recommend her for all state. Mac tipped the can farther up. She's really that good? You sound surprised. He shrugged again. She always sounded good to me, but the old music teacher never singled her out. Rumor is he never took much interest in any of his students individually, or in extra work. <laughs> you got that right. Stryker was an old... He caught himself, glanced back at his kids, who were standing close by, all ears. He was old, Mac repeated, and set in his ways. Always the same Christmas program. The same spring program. Yes, I've looked over his class notes. I'd say everyone should be in for a surprise this year. I'm told no student from Taylor's Grove ever went to Allstate. Not that I heard. Well, we're going to change that. Satisfied now that they had managed a reasonable conversation, she tossed back her hair. Do you sing? In the shower. His dimple flickered again as his sons giggled. No comments from the brats. He sings really, really loud, Zeke said without fear of reprisal, and he gets Zark howling. I'm sure that would be quite a show. Nell scratched the grinning dog between the ears. He thumped his tail, and then some internal clock struck and had him pivoting and racing up the hill. Here you go, Miss Davis, here! Both boys stuffed the loaded paper towels into her hands and barreled off after the dog. I guess they don't keep still very long, she murmured, watching them chase the dog up the rise. That was nearly a record. They like you. I'm a likable person, she smiled, glancing back at him, only to find him staring at her again with that not-quite-pleased look in his eyes. At least in most cases... If you just put that on the back seat, I'll have it filled up for you. It's not a problem. Mac replaced her gas cap and kept the empty can. We're friendly in Taylor's Grove. In most cases. Let me know when I'm off probation. She leaned into her car and set the brownies on the passenger seat. Mac had a tantalizing and uncomfortable view of her jean-clad bottom. He could smell her, too something light and spicy that spun in his head a lot more potently than the gas fumes. I didn't mean it like that. Her head popped back out of the car. She licked a smear of brownie from her finger as she straightened. Maybe not. In any case, I appreciate the help. Her grin flashed as she opened the car door. And the chocolate. Any time, he heard himself say and wanted to regret it. She settled behind the steering wheel, tossed him a quick, saucy smile. Like hell. Then she laughed and turned the ignition, revving the engine in a way that made Mac wince. You should drop in on rehearsals now and again, Mac, instead of waiting out in the parking lot. 
you might learn something. He wasn't certain he wanted to. Put on your seat belt, he ordered. Oh, yeah. Obligingly, she buckled up. Just not used to it yet. Say bye to the twins. She zoomed off at a speed just this side of reckless, waving a careless and glittering hand out the window. Mac watched her until she rounded the bend, then slowly rubbed his stomach where the muscles were knotted. Something about that woman, he thought. Something about the way she was put together made him feel like he was defrosting after a very long freeze. Chapter 3 Another half hour, Mac figured, and he could finish taping the drywall in the master bedroom. Maybe get the first coat of mud on. He glanced at his watch, calculated that the kids were home from school, but it was Mrs. Hollis's day and she'd stay until five. That would give him plenty of time to hit the drywall, clean up, and get home. Maybe he'd give himself and the kids a treat and pick up pizza. He'd learned not to mind cooking, but he still resented the time it took. The thinking, the preparation, the cleaning up afterward. Six years as a single parent had given him a whole new perspective on how hard his mother, that rare and old-fashioned homemaker, had worked. Pausing a moment, he took a look around the master's suite. He'd taken walls out, built others, replaced the old single-pane windows with double-glazed. Twin skylights let in the fading sunlight of early October. Now there were three spacious bedrooms on the second floor of the old house, rather than the four choppy rooms and oversized hallway he'd started with. The master suite would boast a bathroom large enough for tub and separate shower stall. He was toying with using glass block for that. He'd been wanting to work with it for some time. If he stayed on schedule, the place would be put together by Christmas and on the sale or rental market by the first of the year. He really should sell it, Mac thought, running a hand over the drywall he'd nailed up that afternoon. He had to get over this sense of possession whenever he worked on a house. In the blood, he supposed. His father had made a good living buying up damaged or depressed property, rehabbing, and renting. Mac had discovered just how satisfying it was to own something you'd made fine with your own hands. Like the old brick house Nell lived in now. He wondered if she knew it was more than a hundred and fifty years old that she was living in a piece of history. He wondered if she'd run out of gas again. He wondered quite a bit about Nell Davis. And he shouldn't, Mac reminded himself, and turned away for his tools and tape. Women were trouble. One way or the other, they were trouble. One look at Nell and a smart man could see she was no exception. He hadn't taken her up on her suggestion that he drop by the auditorium and catch part of a rehearsal. He'd started to a couple of times, but good sense had stopped him. She was the first woman in a very, very long time who had stirred him up. He didn't want to be stirred up, Mac thought with a scowl as he taped a seam. Couldn't afford to be, he reminded himself. He had too many obligations, too little free time, and most important, two sons who were the focus of his life. Daydreaming about a woman was bad enough. It made a man sloppy in his work, forgetful and itchy. But doing something about it was worse. Doing something meant you had to find conversation and ways to entertain. A woman expected to be taken places and pampered. And once you started to fall for her, really fall for her, she had the power to cut out your heart. Mac wasn't willing to risk his heart again, and he certainly wasn't willing to risk his son's. He didn't subscribe to that nonsense about children needing a woman's touch, a mother's love. The twins' mother had felt less connection with the children she'd born than a cat felt toward a litter of kittens. Being female didn't give you a leg up on maternal feelings. It meant you were physically able to carry a child inside you, but it didn't mean that you'd care once that child was in your arms. Max stopped taping and swore. He hadn't thought about Angie in years, not deeply. When he did, he realized the spot was still sore, 
like an old wound that had healed poorly. That was what he got, he supposed, for letting some little blonde stir him up. Annoyed with himself, he stripped the last piece of tape off the roll. He needed to concentrate on his work, not on a woman. Determined to finish what he'd started, he marched down the stairs. He had more drywall tape in his truck. The light outside was softening with the approach of dusk. Shorter days, he thought. Less time. He was down the steps and onto the walk before he saw her. She was standing just at the edge of the yard, looking up at the house, smiling a little. She wore a suede jacket in a deep burnished orange over faded jeans. Some glittery stones dangled from her ears. Over her shoulder hung a soft-sided briefcase that looked well used. Oh, hi! Surprise lit her eyes when she glanced over, and that immediately made him suspicious. Is this one of your places? That's right. He moved past her toward the truck and wished he'd held his breath. That scent she wore was subtle and sneaky. I was just admiring it. Beautiful stonework. It looked so sturdy and safe, tucked in with all the trees. She took a deep breath. There was the slap of fall in the air. It's going to be a beautiful night. I guess. He found his tape, then stood, running the roll around in his hands. Did you run out of gas again? No. She laughed, obviously amused at herself. I like walking around town this time of day. As a matter of fact, I was heading down to your sister's. She's a few doors down, right? His eyes narrowed. He didn't like the idea of the woman he was spending too much time thinking about hanging out with his sister. Yeah, that's right. Why? Why? Her attention had been focused on his hands. There was something about them. Hard. Calloused. Big. She felt a quick and very pleasant flutter in the pit of her stomach. Why what? Why are you going to Mira's? Oh, I have some sheet music I thought Kim would like. Is that right? He leaned on the truck, measuring her. Her smile was entirely too friendly, he decided. Entirely too attractive. Is it part of your job description to make house calls with sheet music? It's part of the fun. Her hair ruffled in the light breeze. She scooped it back. No job's worth the effort or the headaches if you don't have some fun. She looked back at the house. You have fun, don't you? Taking something and making it yours? He started to say something snide, then realized she'd put her finger right on the heart of it. Yeah, it doesn't always seem like fun when you're tearing out ceilings and having insulation raining down on your head. He smiled a little, but it is. Are you going to let me see? She tilted her head. Or are you like a temperamental artist not willing to show his work until the final brush stroke? There's not much to see. Then he shrugged. Sure. You can come in if you want. Thanks. She started up the walk, glanced over her shoulder when he stayed by the truck. Aren't you going to give me a tour? He moved his shoulders again and joined her. Did you do the trim on my apartment? Yeah. It's beautiful work. Looks like cherry. He frowned, surprised. It is cherry. I like the rounded edges. They soften everything. Do you get a decorator in for the colors or pick them out yourself? I pick them. He opened the door for her. Is there a problem? No. I really love the color scheme in the kitchen. The slate blue counters, the mauve floor. Oh, what fabulous stairs. She hurried across the unfinished living area to the staircase. Mac had worked hard and long on it, tearing out the old and replacing it with dark chestnut, curving and widening the landing at the bottom so that it flowed out into the living space. It was, undeniably, his current pride and joy. Did you build these? She murmured, running a hand over the curve of the railing. The old ones were broken, dry-rotted, had to go. I have to try them. She dashed up, turning back at the top to grin at him. No creaks. Good workmanship, but not very sentimental. Sentimental? You know, 
The way you look back on home, how you snuck downstairs as a kid and knew just which steps to avoid because they'd creak and wake up Mom. All at once he was having trouble with his breathing. They're chestnut, he said, because he could think of nothing else. Whatever, they're beautiful. Whoever lives here has to have kids. His mouth was dry, unbearably. Why? Because. On impulse, she planted her butt on the railing and pushed off. Max's arms came out of their own volition to catch her as she flew off the end. It was made for sliding, she said breathlessly. She was laughing as she tilted her head up to his. Something clicked inside her when their eyes met, and the fluttering, not so pleasant this time, came again. Disconcerted, she cleared her throat and searched for something to say. You keep popping up, Mac muttered. He had yet to release her, couldn't seem to make his hands obey his head. It's a small town. He only shook his head. His hands were at her waist now, and they seemed determined to slide around and stroke up her back. He thought he felt her tremble, but it might have been him. I don't have time for women, he told her, trying to convince himself. Well, she tried to swallow, but there was something hard and hot lodged in her throat. I'm pretty busy myself. She let out a slow breath. Those hands stroking up and down her back were making her weak. And I'm not really interested. I had a really bad year as far as relationships go. I think it was very hard to think. His eyes were such a beautiful shade of blue and so intensely focused on hers. She wasn't sure what he saw or what he was looking for, but she knew her knees were about to give out. I think she began again. We'd both be better off if you decide fairly quickly if you're going to kiss me or not. I can't handle this much longer. Neither could he. Still, he took his time. He was, in all things, a thorough and thoughtful man. His eyes were open and on hers as he lowered his head, as his mouth hovered a breath from hers, as a small, whimpering moan sounded in her throat. Her vision dimmed as his lips brushed hers. His were soft, firm, terrifyingly patient. The whisper of contact slammed a punch into her stomach. He lingered over her like a gourmet sampling delicacies, deepening the kiss degree by staggering degree until she was clinging to him. No one had ever kissed her like this. She hadn't known anyone could. Slow and deep and dreamy. The floor seemed to tilt under her feet as he gently sucked her lower lip into his mouth. She shuddered, groaned, and let herself drown. She was very potent. The scent and feel and taste of her was overwhelming. He knew he could lose himself here for a moment, for a lifetime. Her small, tight body was all but plastered to his. Her hands clutched his hair. In contrast to that aggressive gesture, her head fell limply back in a kind of sighing surrender that had his blood bubbling. He wanted to touch her. His hands were aching with the need to peel off layer after layer and find the pale, smooth skin beneath. To test himself, and her, he slipped his fingers under her sweater, along the soft, hot flesh of her back, while his mouth continued its long, lazy assault on hers. He imagined laying her down on the floor, on a tarp, on the grass. He imagined watching her face as he pleasured them both, of feeling her arch toward him, open, accepting. It had been too long, he told himself, as his muscles began to coil and his lungs to labor. It had just been too long. But he didn't believe it, and it frightened him. Unsteady, he lifted his head, drew back. Even as he began the retreat, she leaned against him, letting her head fall onto his chest. 
Unable to resist, he combed his fingers through her hair and cradled her there. My head's spinning, she murmured. What was that? It was a kiss, that's all. He needed to believe that. It would help to ease the tightness around his heart and his loins. I think I saw stars. Still staggered, she shifted so that she could look up at him. Her lips curved, but her eyes didn't echo the smile. That's a first for me. If he didn't do something fast, he was going to kiss her again. He set her firmly on her feet. It doesn't change anything. Was there something to change? The light was nearly gone now. It helped that he couldn't see her clearly in the gloom. I don't have time for women, and I'm just not interested in starting anything. Oh. Where had that pain come from, she wondered, and had to fight to keep from rubbing a hand over her heart. That was quite a kiss for a disinterested man. Reaching down, she scooped up the briefcase she'd dropped before she'd run up the stairs. I'll get out of your way. I wouldn't want to waste any more of your valuable time. You don't have to get huffy about it. Huffy? Her teeth snapped together. She jabbed a finger into his chest. I'm well beyond huffy, pal, and working my way past steamed. You've got some ego, Mac. What, do you think I came around here to seduce you? I don't know why you came around. Well, I won't be around again. She settled her briefcase on her shoulder, jerked her chin up. Nobody twisted your arm. He was dealing with an uncomfortable combination of desire and guilt. Yours either. I'm not the one making excuses. You know, I can't figure out how such an insensitive clod could raise two charming and adorable kids. Leave my boys out of this. The edge to the order had her eyes narrowing to slits. Oh, so I have designs on them now, too? You idiot! She stormed for the door, whirling at the last moment for a parting shot. I hope they don't inherit your warped view of the female species. She slammed the door hard enough to have the bad-tempered sound echoing through the house. Max scowled and jammed his hands in his pockets. He didn't have a warped view, damn it. And his kids were his business. Chapter 4 Nell stood center stage and lifted her hands. She waited until she was sure every student's eyes were on her, then let it rip. There was very little that delighted her more than the sound of young voices raised in song. She let the sound fill her, keeping her ears and eyes sharp as she moved around the stage, directing. She couldn't hold back the grin. The kids were into this one. Doing Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band's version of Santa Claus is Coming to Town was a departure from the standard carols and hymns their former choral director had arranged year after year. She could see their eyes light up as they got into the rhythm. Now punch it, she thought, pulling more from the bass section as they hit the chorus. Have fun with it. Now the soprano section, high and bright, and the altos, tenors, bass. She flashed a smile to signal her approval as the chorus flowered again. Good job, she announced. Tenors, a little more next time. You guys don't want the bass section drowning you out. Holly, you're dropping your chin again. Now we have time for one more run-through of I'll Be Home for Christmas. Kim? Kim tried to ignore the little flutter around her heart and the elbow nudge from Holly. She stepped down from her position in the second row and stood in front of the solo mic as though she were facing a firing squad. It's okay to smile, you know, Nell told her gently, and remember your breathing. Sing to the last row and don't forget to feel the words. Tracy? She held out a finger toward the pianist she'd dragooned from her second period music class. The intro started quietly. Using her hands, her face, her eyes, Nell signaled the beginning of the soft, harmonious background humming. Then Kim began to sing. Too tentatively at first, Nell knew they would have to work on those initial nerves. But the girl had talent and emotion. 
Three bars in, Kim was too caught up in the song to be nervous. She was pacing it well, Nell thought, pleased. Kim had learned quite a bit in the past few weeks about style. The sentimental song suited her, her range, her looks. Nell brought the chorus in, holding them back. They were background now for Kim's rich, romantic voice. Feeling her own eyes stinging, Nell thought that if they did it this well on the night of the concert, there wouldn't be a dry eye in the house. Lovely, Nell said when the last notes had died away. Really lovely. You guys have come a long way in a very short time. I'm awfully proud of you. Now, scram and have a great weekend. While Nell moved to the piano to gather up music, the chatter began behind her. You sounded really good, Holly told Kim. Honest? Honest. Brad thought so, too. Holly shifted her eyes cagily to the school heartthrob who was shrugging into his school jacket. He doesn't even know I'm alive. He does now. He was watching you the whole time. I know because I was watching him. Holly sighed. If I looked like Miss Davis, he'd be watching me. Kim laughed, but shot a quick glance toward Brad under her lashes. She's really fabulous, just the way she talks to us and stuff. Mr. Stryker always crabbed. Mr. Stryker was a crab. See you later, huh? Yeah. It was all Kim could manage because it looked, it really looked, as though Brad were coming toward her. And he was looking at her. Hi. He flashed a grin, all white teeth with a crooked incisor that made her heart flop around in her chest. You did real good. Thanks. Her tongue tied itself into knots. This was Brad, she kept thinking. A senior. Captain of the football team. Student council president. All blonde hair and green eyes. Miss Davis sure is cool, isn't she? Yeah. Say something, she ordered herself. She's coming to a party at my house tonight. My mom's having some people over. Adults only, huh? No, Holly's coming by and a couple other people. Her heart thundered in her ears as she screwed up her courage. You could drop by if you wanted. That'd be cool. What time? She managed to close her mouth and swallow. Oh, about eight, she said, struggling for the casual touch. I live on... I know where you live. He grinned at her again and all but stopped her thundering heart. Hey, you're not going with Chuck anymore, are you? Chuck? Who was Chuck? Oh, no. We hung out for a while, but we sort of broke up over the summer. Great. See you later. He strolled off to join a group of boys who were trooping off stage. That's a very cute guy. Nell commented from behind Kim. Yeah. The word was a sigh. Kim had stars in her eyes. Kimmy has a boyfriend, Zeke sang in the high-pitched, annoying voice that was reserved for addressing younger siblings or female cousins. Shut up, brat. He only giggled and began to dance around the stage, sing-songing the refrain. Nell saw murder shoot into Kim's eyes and created a diversion. Well, I guess you guys don't want to practice jingle bells today. Yes, we do! Zack stopped twirling around the stage with his brother and dashed to the piano. I know which one it is, he said, attacking Nell's neat pile of sheet music. I can find it! I'll find it, Zeke said, but his brother was already holding the music up triumphantly. Good going! Nell settled on the bench with a boy on either side of her. She played a dramatic opening chord that made them both giggle. Please, music is a serious business. And one, and two, and... They actually sang it now instead of screaming it as they had the first time she invited them to try. What they lacked in style, they made up for in enthusiasm. In spades. Even Kim was grinning by the time they'd finished. Now you do one, Miss Davis. Zack gave her his soulful look. Please? Your dad is probably waiting. Just one? 
Just one, Zeke echoed. In a few short weeks, it had become impossible for her to resist them. Just one, Nell agreed and reached into the now messy pile of music. I picked up something you might like at the mall. I bet you've seen The Little Mermaid. Lots of times, Zeke boasted. We've got the tape and everything. Then you'll recognize this. She played the opening of Part of Your World. Mac hunched his shoulders against the wind as he headed into the school. He was damn sick and tired of waiting out in the parking lot. He'd seen the other kids filing out more than ten minutes before. He had things to do, damn it, especially since he was stuck going over to Mira's for a party. He hated parties. He stomped down the hall, and he heard her. Not the words. He couldn't make out the words because they were muffled by the auditorium doors. But the sound of her voice, rich and deep, a scotch and soda voice he'd thought more than once, sensual, seductive, sexy. He opened the door, he had to, and the lush flow of it rolled over him. A kid's song. He recognized it now from the mermaid movie the boys were still crazy about. He told himself no sane man would get tied up in knots when a woman sang a kid's song. But he wasn't feeling very sane. Hadn't been since he made the enormous mistake of kissing her. And he knew that if she'd been alone, he would have marched right over to the piano and kissed her again. But she wasn't alone. Kim was standing behind her, and his children flanked her. Now and again, she glanced down at them as she sang and smiled. Zack was leaning toward her, his head tilting in the way it did just before he climbed into your lap. Something shifted inside him as he watched. Something painful and frightening. And very, very sweet. Shaken, Max stuffed his hands into his pockets, curled those hands into fists. It had to stop. Whatever was happening to him had to stop. He took a long breath when the music ended. He thought, foolishly, he was sure, that there was something magical humming in the instant of silence that followed. We're running late, he called out, determined to break the spell. Four heads turned his way. The twins began to bounce on the bench. Dad! Hey, Dad! We can sing Jingle Bells really good! Want to hear us? I can't. He tried to smile, softening the blow, when Zack's lip poked out. I'm really running late, kids. Sorry, Uncle Mac. Kim scooped up her coat. We kind of lost track. While Mac shifted uncomfortably, Nell leaned over and murmured something to his sons. Something, Mac noted, that put a smile back on Zack's face and took the mutinous look off Zeke's. Then both of them threw arms around her and kissed her before they raced off stage for their coats. Bye, Miss Davis! Bye! Thanks, Miss Davis, Kim added. See you later. Nell made a humming sound and rose to straighten her music. Mac felt the punch of her cold shoulder all the way in the back of the auditorium. Ah... Uh, Thanks for entertaining them, he called out. This is the end of disc number one. Please insert disc number two. This is disc number two. Nell made a humming sound and rose to straighten her music. Mac felt the punch of her cold shoulder all the way in the back of the auditorium. Ah, uh, thanks for entertaining them, he called out. Nell lifted her head. He could see her clearly in the stage lights, clearly enough that he caught the lift of her brow, the coolness of her unsmiling mouth, before she lowered her head again. Fine he told himself as he caught both boys on the fly. He didn't want to talk to her anyway. Chapter 5 She didn't have to ignore him so completely. Mac sipped the cup of hard cider his brother-in-law had pressed on him and resentfully studied Nell's back. 
She'd had it turned in his direction for an hour. A hell of a back, too, he thought, half listening as the mayor rattled on in his ear. Smooth and straight, topped off by the fluid curve of her shoulders. It looked very seductive in the thin, plum-colored jacket she wore over a short matching dress. She had terrific legs. He didn't think he'd ever actually seen them before. He would have remembered. Every other time he'd run into her, she'd had them covered up. She'd probably worn a dress tonight to torment him. Mac cut the mayor off in midstream and strode over to her. Look, this is stupid. Nell glanced up. She'd been having a pleasant conversation with a group of Mira's friends and thoroughly enjoying the simple act of ignoring Mira's brother. Excuse me? It's just stupid, he repeated. The need to raise more money for the arts in public school is stupid, she asked, well aware he wasn't referring to the topic she'd been discussing. What? No! Damn it, you know what I mean. I'm sorry. She started to turn back to the circle of very interested faces, but he took her arm and pulled her aside. Do you want me to cause a scene in your sister's house? Nell said between her teeth. No. He weaved his way through the minglers, around the dining room table, and through the kitchen door. His sister was busy replenishing a tray of canapes. Give us a minute, he ordered Mira. Mac, I'm busy here. Distracted, Mira smoothed a hand over her short brunette hair. Would you find Dave and tell him we're running low on cider? She sent Nell a frazzled smile. I thought I was organized. Give us a minute, Mac repeated. Mira let out an impatient breath, but then her eyebrows shot up, drew in. Well, well, she murmured, amused and clearly delighted. I'll just get out of your way. I want a closer look at that boy Kim's so excited about. She picked up the tray of finger food and swung through the kitchen door. Silence fell like a hammer. So? Casually, Nell plucked a carrot stick from a bowl. Something on your mind, Macaulay? I don't see why you have to be so... So... She crunched into the carrot. What? You're making a point of not talking to me. She smiled. Yes, I am. It's stupid. She located an open bottle of white wine, poured some into a glass. After a sip, she smiled again. I don't think so. It seems to me that for no discernible reason, I annoy you. Since I'm quite fond of your family, it seems logical and courteous to stay as far out of your way as I possibly can. She sipped again. Now, is that all? I've been enjoying myself so far this evening. You don't annoy me. Exactly. He couldn't find anything to do with his hands, so he settled on taking a carrot stick and breaking it in half. I'm sorry. For before. You're sorry for kissing me, or for behaving like a jerk afterward? He tossed the pieces of carrot down. You're a hard one, Nell. Wait. Eyes wide, she pressed a hand to her ear. I think something's wrong with my hearing. I thought for just a minute you actually said my name. Cut it out, he said, then deliberately, Nell. This is a moment, she declared and toasted him. Macaulay Taylor has actually initiated a conversation with me and used my name. I'm all a flutter. Look! Temper had him rounding the counter. He'd nearly grabbed her before he pushed his anger back. I just want to clear the air. Fascinated, she studied his now impassive face. That's quite a control button you've got there, Mac. It's admirable. Still, I wonder what would happen if you didn't push it so often. A man raising two kids on his own needs control. I suppose, she murmured. Now, if that's all, I'm sorry, he said again. This time she softened. She was simply no good at holding a grudge. Okay, let's just forget it. Friends, she offered and held out a hand. He took it. It was so soft, 
looked so small he couldn't make himself give it up again. Her eyes were soft, too, just now. Big, liquid eyes you'd have expected to see on a fawn. You look nice. Thanks. You too. You like the party? I like the people. Her pulse was starting to jump. Damn him. Your sister's wonderful. So full of energy and ideas. You have to watch her. His lips curved slowly. She'll rope you into one of her projects. Too late. She's got me on the arts committee already, and I've been volunteered to help with the recycling campaign. The trick is to duck. I don't mind, really. I think I'm going to enjoy it. His thumb was brushing over her wrist now lightly. Mac, don't start something you don't intend to finish. Brow creased, he looked down at their joined hands. I think about you. I don't have time to think about you. I don't want to have time. It was happening again, the flutters and quivers she seemed to have no control over. What do you want? His gaze lifted, locked with hers. I'm having some trouble with that. The kitchen door burst open and a horde of teenagers piled in, only to be brought up short as Kim, in the lead, stopped on a dime. Her eyes widened as she watched her uncle drop her teacher's hand, and the two of them jumped apart like a couple of teenagers caught necking on the living room sofa. Sorry. Ah, uh, sorry, she repeated, goggling. We were just... She turned on her heel and shoved back at her friends. They scooted out, chuckling. That ought to add some juice to the grapevine, Nell said wryly. She'd been in town long enough to know that everyone would be speculating about Mac Taylor and Nell Davis by morning. Steadier now, she turned back to him. Listen, why don't we try this in nice, easy stages? You want to go out to dinner tomorrow, see a movie or something? Now it was his turn to stare. A date? Are you asking me out on a date? Impatience flickered back. Yes, a date. It doesn't mean I'm asking to bear you more children. On second thought, let's just quit while we're ahead. I want to get my hands on you. Mac heard himself say the words, knew it was too late to take them back. Nell reached for her wine in self-defense. Well, that's simple. No, it isn't. She braced herself and looked up at him again. No, she agreed quietly. Just how many times, she wondered, had his face popped into her mind in the past few weeks? She couldn't count them. It's not simple. But something had to be done, he decided. A move forward, a move back. Take a step, he ordered himself. See what happens. I haven't been to a movie without the kids. I can't remember. I could probably line up a sitter. All right. She was watching him now almost as carefully as he watched her. Give me a call if it works out. I'll be home most of tomorrow, correcting papers. It wasn't the easiest thing, stepping back into the dating pool, however small the pool and however warm the water. It irritated him that he was nervous, almost as much as his niece's grins and questions had irritated when she agreed to babysit. Now, as he climbed the sturdy outside steps to Nell's third-floor apartment, Mac wondered if it would be better all around if they forgot the whole thing. As he stepped onto her deck, he noticed that she'd flanked the door with pots of mums. It was a nice touch, he thought. He always appreciated it when someone who rented one of his homes cared enough to bother with those nice touches. It was just a movie, he reminded himself, and rapped on the door. When she opened it, he was relieved that she'd dressed casually, a hip grazing sweater over a pair of those snug leggings Kim liked so much. Then she smiled and had his mouth going dry. Hi, you're right on time. Do you want to come in and see what I've done to your place? It's your place, as long as you pay the rent, he told her. But she was reaching out, taking his hand, drawing him in. Mac had dispensed with the walls that had made stingy little rooms and had created one flowing space of living, dining, and kitchen area. 
and she'd known what to do with it. There was a huge L-shaped couch in a bold floral print that should have been shocking but was, instead, perfect. A small table under the window held a pot of dried autumn leaves. Shelves along one wall held books, a stereo, and a small TV, and the sort of knick-knacks he knew women liked. She'd turned the dining area into a combination music room and office, with her desk and a small spinet. A flute lay on a music stand. "'I didn't bring a lot with me from New York,' she said as she shrugged into her jacket. "'Only what I really cared about. I'm filling in with things from antique shops and flea markets. "'We've got a million of them,' he murmured. "'It looks good.' And it did. The old faded rug on the floor, the fussy Priscilla's at the windows. Comfortable. Comfortable's very important to me. Ready? Sure. And it wasn't so hard after all. He'd asked her to pick the movie, and she'd gone for comedy. It was surprisingly relaxing to sit in the darkened theater and share popcorn and laughter. He only thought about her as a woman, a very attractive woman, a couple of dozen times. Going for pizza afterward seemed such a natural progression, he suggested it himself. They competed for a table in the crowded pizzeria with teenagers out on date night. So, Nell stretched out in the booth. How's Zeke's career in spelling coming along? It's a struggle. He really works at it. It's funny. Zach can spell almost anything you toss at him first time around, but Zeke has to study the word like a scholar with the Dead Sea Scrolls. He's good at his arithmetic. Yeah. Mac wasn't sure how he felt about her knowing so much about his kids. They're both taken with you. It's mutual. She skimmed a hand through her hair. It's going to sound odd, but... She hesitated, not quite sure how to word it. But that first day at rehearsal, when I looked around and saw them... I had this feeling, this, I don't know, it was like, oh, there you are. I was wondering when you'd show up. It sounds strange, but it was as if I was expecting them. Now when Kim comes without them, I feel let down. I guess they kind of grow on you. It was more than that, but she didn't know how to explain. And she wasn't entirely sure Mac would accept the fact that she'd very simply fallen for them. I get a kick out of them telling me about their school day, showing me their papers. First report cards are almost here. His grin flashed. I'm more nervous than they are. People put too much emphasis on grades. His brows shot up at the comment. This from a teacher? Individual ability, application, effort, retention. Those things are a lot more important than A, B, or C. But I can tell you in confidence that Kim's acing advanced chorus in music history. No kidding. He felt a quick surge of pride. She never did that well before. Bees, mostly. Mr. Stryker and I have markedly different approaches. You're telling me. Word around town is that the chorus is dynamite this year. How'd you pull it off? The kids pull it off, she told him, sitting up when their pizza was served. My job is to make them think and sing like a team. Not to slam Mr. Stryker, she added, taking a generous bite, but I get the impression he was just putting in time, counting the days until he could retire. If you're going to teach kids, you have to like them and respect them. There's a lot of talent there, some of it extremely rough. When she laughed, the roses in her cheek bloomed deeper. And some of those kids will do nothing more than sing in the shower for the rest of their lives, for which the world can be grateful. Got some clinkers, huh? Well, she laughed again. Yes, I have a few. But they're enjoying themselves. That's what counts. And there are a few, like Kim, who are really something special. I'm sending her and two others for auditions to All State next week. And after the holiday concert, I'm going to hold auditions for the spring musical. We haven't had a musical at the high school in three years. We're going to have one this year, Buster, and it's going to be terrific. It's a lot of work for you. I like it, and it's what I'm paid for. Mac toyed with a second slice. You really do like it, don't you?
the school, the town, the whole bit. Why shouldn't I? It's a fine school, a fine town. It ain't Manhattan. Exactly. Why'd you leave? He winced. Sorry, none of my business. It's all right. I had a bad year. I guess I was getting restless before that, but the last year was just the pits. They eliminated my job at the school, economic cutbacks, downsizing. The arts are always the first to suffer. She shrugged. Anyway, my roommate got married. I couldn't afford the rent on my own, not if I wanted to eat with any regularity, so I advertised for another one. Took references, gauged personalities. With a sigh, she propped her chin on her elbow. I thought I was careful. But about three weeks after she moved in, I came home and found that she'd cleaned me out. Max stopped eating. She robbed you? She skinned me. TV, stereo, whatever good jewelry I had, cash, the collection of Limoges boxes I'd started in college. I was really steamed. And then I was shaken. I just wasn't comfortable living there after it happened. Then the guy I'd been seeing for about a year started giving me lectures on my stupidity, my naivete. As far as he was concerned, I'd gotten exactly what I'd deserved. Nice guy, Mac muttered. Very supportive. You bet. In any case, I took a good look at him and our relationship and figured he was right on one level. As long as I was in that rut, with him, I was getting what I deserved. So I decided to climb out of the rut and leave him in it. Good choice. I thought so. And so was he, she thought, studying Mac's face. A very good choice. Why don't you tell me what your plans are with the house you're renovating? I don't guess you'd know a lot about plumbing. She only smiled. I'm a quick learner. It was nearly midnight when he pulled up in front of her apartment. He hadn't intended to stay out so late. He certainly hadn't expected to spend more than an hour talking to her about wiring and plumbing and load-bearing walls, or drawing little blueprints on napkins. But somehow he'd managed to get through the evening without feeling foolish or pinned down or out of step. Only one thing worried him. He wanted to see her again. I think this was a good first step. She laid a hand over his, kissed his cheek. Thanks. I'll walk you up. Her hand was already on the door handle. Safer, she'd decided for both of them, if she just hurried along. You don't have to. I know the way. I'll walk you up, he repeated. He stepped out, rounded the hood. They started up the stairs together. The tenant on the first floor was still awake. The mutter of a television and its ghost-gray light filtered through the window. Since the breeze had died, it was the only sound. And overhead, countless stars wheeled in a clear black sky. If we do this again, Mac began, people in town are going to start talking about us, making out that we're... He wasn't quite sure of the right phrase. An item, Nell supplied. That bothers you. I don't want the kids to get any ideas or worry or whatever. As they reached the landing, he looked down at her and was caught again. It must be the way you look, he murmured. What must? That makes me think about you. It was a reasonable explanation, he decided. Physical attraction. After all, he wasn't a dead man. He was just a careful one. That makes me think about doing this. He cupped her face in his hands, a gesture so sweet, so tender, it had every muscle in her body going lax. It was just as slow, as stunning, as sumptuous as the first time. The touch of his mouth on hers, the shuddering patience, the simple wonder of it. Could it be this, she wondered? Could it be this that she'd been waiting for? Could it be him? He heard her soft, breathy sigh as he eased his mouth from hers. Lingering, he knew, would be a mistake, and he let his hands fall away before they could reach for more. As if to capture one final taste, Nell ran her tongue over her lips. You're awfully good at that, Macaulay. Awfully good. 
You could say I've been saving up. But he didn't think it was that at all. He was very much worried it wasn't that. I'll see you. She nodded weakly as he headed down the steps. She was still leaning dreamily against the door when she heard his car start and drive away. For a moment, she would have sworn the air rang with the distant music of sleigh bells. Chapter 6 The end of October meant parent-teacher conferences and a much-anticipated holiday for students. It also meant a headache for Mac. He had to juggle the twins from his sister to Kim to Mrs. Hollis, fitting in a trip to order materials and an electrical inspection. When he turned his truck into the educational complex, he was jumpy with nerves. Lord knew what he was about to be told about his children, how they behaved when they were out of his sight and his control. He worried that he hadn't made enough time to help them with their schoolwork and somehow missed a parental step in preparing them for the social, educational, and emotional demands of first grade. Because of his failure, his boys would become antisocial, illiterate neurotics. He knew he was being ridiculous, but he couldn't stop his fears from playing over and over like an endless loop in his brain. Mac! The car horn and the sound of his name had him turning and focusing, finally, on his sister's car. She leaned out the window, shaking her head at him. Where were you? I called you three times. Bailing my kids out of jail, he muttered and changed course to walk to her car. I've got a conference in a minute. I know. I've just come from a meeting at the high school. Remember we compared schedules? Right. I shouldn't be late. You don't get demerits. My meeting was about raising funds for new chorus uniforms. Those kids have been wearing the same old choir robes for 12 years. We're hoping to raise enough to put them into something a little snazzier. Fine, I'll give you a donation, but I shouldn't be late. Already he was imagining the young, fresh-faced first-grade teacher marking him tardy. Just another item on a growing list of negatives about Taylor Males. I just wanted to say that Nell seemed upset about something. What? Upset, Mira repeated, pleased that she finally had his full attention. She came up with a couple of nice ideas for fundraisers, but she was obviously distracted. Mira lifted a brow, eyeing her brother slyly. You haven't done anything to annoy her, have you? No. Mac caught himself before he shifted guiltily from foot to foot. Why should I? Couldn't say. But since you've been seeing her, we went to the movies. And for pizza, Mira added, a couple of Kim's friends spotted you. The curse of small towns, Mac thought, and stuffed his hands in his pockets. So? So nothing. Good for you. I like her a lot. Kim's crazy about her. I suppose I'm feeling a bit protective. She was definitely upset, Mac, and trying not to show it. Maybe she'd talk to you about it. I'm not going to go poking around in her personal life. The way I see it, you're part of her personal life. See you later. She pulled off without giving him a chance for a parting shot. Muttering to himself, Mac marched up to the elementary school. When he marched out, twenty minutes later, he was in a much lighter mood. His children had not been declared social misfits with homicidal tendencies after all. In fact, their teacher had praised them. Of course, he'd known all along. Maybe Zeke forgot the rules now and then and talked to his neighbor, and maybe Zack was a little shy about raising his hand when he knew an answer. But they were settling in. With the weight of first grade off his shoulders, Mac headed out. Impulse had him swinging toward the high school. He knew his conference had been one of the last of the day. He wasn't sure how teachers' meetings worked at the high school, but the lot was nearly empty. He spotted Nell's car, however, and decided it wouldn't hurt just to drop in. It wasn't until he was inside that he realized he didn't have a clue as to where to find her. Mac poked his head into the auditorium, but it was empty. Since he'd come that far, he backtracked to the main office and caught one of the secretaries as she was leaving for the day. Following her directions, he turned down a corridor, headed up a ramp, and turned right. Nell's classroom door was open. Not like any classroom he'd done time in, he thought. 
This one had a piano, music stands, instruments, a tape recorder. There was the usual blackboard wiped clean and a desk where Nell was currently working. He watched her for a long moment, the way her hair fell, the way her fingers held the pen, the way her sweater draped at the neck. It occurred to him that if he'd ever had a teacher who looked like that, he would have been a great deal more interested in music. Hi. Her head snapped up. There was a martial light in her eyes that surprised him, a stubborn set to her jaw. Even as he watched, she took a long breath and worked up a smile. Hello, Mac. Welcome to Bedlam. Looks like a lot of work. He stepped inside up to the desk. It was covered with papers, books, computer printouts, and sheet music, all in what appeared to be ordered piles. Finishing up the first marking period, grades, class planning, fundraising strategy, fine-tuning the holiday concert, and trying to make the budget stretch to producing the spring musical. Trying to keep her foul mood to herself, she sat back. So how was your day? Pretty good. I just had a conference with the twins' teacher. They're doing fine. I can stop sweating report cards. They're great kids. You've got nothing to worry about. Worry comes with the territory. What are you worried about? He asked before he could remind himself he wasn't going to pry. How much time have you got? She shot back. Enough. Curious, he eased a hip onto the edge of her desk. He wanted to soothe, he discovered, to stroke away that faint line between her brows. Rough day? She jerked her shoulders, then pushed away from her desk. Temper always forced her to move. I've had better. Do you know how much school and community support the football team gets? All the sports teams. She began to slap cassette tapes into a box, anything to keep her hands busy. Even the band. But the chorus, we have to go begging for every dollar. You're ticked off about the budget? Why shouldn't I be? She whirled back, eyes hot. No problem getting equipment for the football team so a bunch of boys can go out on the field and tackle each other, but I have to spend an hour on my knees if I want 80 bucks to get a piano tuned. She caught herself, sighed. I don't have anything against football. I like it. High school sports are important. I know a guy who tunes pianos, Max said. He'd probably donate his time. Nell rubbed a hand over her face, slid it around to soothe the tension at the back of her neck. Dad can fix anything, she thought, just as the twins had claimed. Have a problem? Call Mac. That would be great, she said, and managed a real smile. If I can beat my way through the paperwork and get approval. You can't even take freebies without going through the board. It irritated her, as always. One of the worst aspects of teaching is the bureaucracy. Maybe I should have stuck with performing in clubs. You performed in clubs? In another life, she muttered, waving it away. A little singing to pay my way through college. It was better than waiting tables. Anyway, it's not the budget, not really, or even the lack of interest from the community. I'm used to that. Do you want to tell me what it is, or do you want to stew about it? I was having a pretty good time stewing about it. She sighed again and looked up at him. He seemed so solid, so dependable. Maybe I'm too much of an urbanite after all. I've had my first run-in with old-fashioned rural attitude, and I'm stumped. Do you know Hank Rohrer? Sure, he has a dairy farm out on Old Oak Road. I think his oldest kid is in the same class as Kim. Hank Jr., yes. Junior's one of my students, a very strong baritone. He has a real interest in music. He even writes it. No kidding. That's great. You'd think so, wouldn't you? Nell tossed her hair back and went to her desk again to tidy her already tidy papers. Well, I asked Mr. and Mrs. Rohrer to come in this morning because Junior backed out of going to all state auditions this weekend. I knew he had a very good chance of making it, and I wanted to discuss the possibility with his parents of a music scholarship. When I told them how talented Junior was and how I hoped they'd encourage him to change his mind about the auditions, Hank Sr. acted as though I'd just insulted him. He was appalled. 
There was bitterness in her voice now as well as anger. No son of his was going to waste his time on singing and writing music like some... She trailed off, too furious to repeat the man's opinion of musicians. They didn't even know Junior was in my class. Thought he was taking shop as his elective this year. I tried to smooth it over, said that Junior needed a fine art credit to graduate. It didn't do much good. Mr. Rohrer could barely swallow the idea of Junior staying in my class. He went on about how Junior didn't need singing lessons to run a farm, and he certainly wasn't going to allow him to take a Saturday and go audition when the boy had chores. And I'm to stop putting any fancy ideas about college in the boy's head. They've got four kids, Max said slowly. Tuition might be a problem. If that were the only obstacle, they should be grateful for the possibility of scholarship. She slapped her grade book closed. What we have is a bright, talented boy who has dreams. Dreams he'll never be able to explore because his parents won't permit it. Or his father won't, she added. His mother didn't say two words the entire time they were here. Could be she'll work on Hank once she has him alone. Could be he'll take out his annoyance with me on both of them. Hank's not like that. He's set in his ways and thinks he knows all the answers, but he isn't mean. It's a little tough for me to see his virtues after he called me... She had to take a deep breath. A slick-handed flatlander who's wasting his hard-earned tax dollars. I could have made a difference with that boy. Nell murmured as she sat again. I know it. So maybe you won't be able to make a difference with Junior. You'll make a difference with someone else. You've already made one with Kim. Thanks. Nell's smile was brief. That helps a little. I mean it. He hated to see her this way. All that brilliant energy and optimism dimmed. She's gained a lot of confidence in herself. She's always been shy about her singing, about a lot of things. Now she's really opening up. It did help to hear it. This time Nell's smile came easier. So I should stop brooding. It doesn't suit you. He surprised himself and her by reaching down to run his knuckles over her cheek. Smiling does. I've never been able to hold on to temperament for long. Bob used to say it was because I was shallow. Who the hell is Bob? The one who's still in the rut. Clearly where he belongs. She laughed. I'm glad you dropped by. I'd have probably sat here for another hour clenching my jaw. It's a pretty jaw, Mac murmured, then shifted away. I've got to get going. I've got Halloween costumes to put together. Need any help? I... It was tempting, too tempting, and far too dangerous, he thought, to start sharing family traditions with her. No, I've got it covered. Nell accepted the disappointment, nearly masked it. You'll bring them by Saturday night, won't you, to trick-or-treat? Sure. I'll see you. He started out but stopped at the doorway and turned back. Nell? Yes? Some things take a while to change. Change makes some people nervous. She tilted her head. Are you talking about the Roarers, Mac? Among others. I'll see you Saturday night. Nell studied the empty doorway as his footsteps echoed away. Did he think she was trying to change him? Was she? She sat back, pushing away from the paperwork. She'd never be able to concentrate on it now. Whenever she was around Macaulay Taylor, it was hard to concentrate. When had she become so susceptible to the slow, thorough, quiet type? From the moment he'd walked into the auditorium to pick up Kim and the twins, she admitted. Love at first sight? Surely she was too sophisticated, too smart to believe in such a thing. And surely, she added, she was too smart to put herself in the vulnerable position of falling in love with a man who didn't return her feelings. Or didn't want to, she thought. And that was even worse. It couldn't matter that he was sweet and kind and devoted to his children. It shouldn't matter that he was handsome and strong and sexy. She wouldn't let it matter that being with him, thinking of him, 
had her longing for things, for home, for family, for laughter in the kitchen and passion in bed. She let out a long breath because it did matter. It mattered very much when a woman was teetering right on the edge of falling in love. Chapter 7 Mid-November had stripped the leaves from the trees. There was a beauty even in this, Nell had decided. Beauty in the dark, denuded branches, in the papery rustle of dried leaves along the curbs, in the frost that shimmered like diamond dust on the grass in the mornings. She caught herself staring out of the window too often, wishing for snow like a child hoping for a school holiday. It felt wonderful, wonderful to anticipate the winter, to remember the fall. She often thought about Halloween night and all the children who had come knocking on her door dressed as pirates and princesses. She remembered the way Zeke and Zack had giggled when she pretended not to recognize them in the elaborate astronaut costumes Mac had fashioned for them. She found herself reminiscing about the bluegrass concert Mac had taken her to, or the fun they'd had when she ran into him and the boys at the mall just last week, all of them on a mission to complete their Christmas lists early. Now, strolling past the house Mac was remodeling, she thought of him again. It had been so sweet the way he'd struggled over choosing just the right outfit for Kim's present. No thoughtless gifts for Macaulay Taylor for those he cared about. It had to be the right color, the right style. She'd come to believe everything about him was right. She passed the house, drawing in the chilly air of evening, her mood buoyant. That afternoon, she'd been proud to announce that two of her students would participate in all-state chorus. She had made a difference, Nell thought, shutting her eyes on the pleasure of it. Not just the prestige— Certainly not simply the delight of having the principal congratulate her. The difference, the important one, had been the look on her students' faces. The pride, not just on Kim's face and that of the tenor who would go to Allstate with her, but on the faces of the entire chorus. They all shared in the triumph because over the past few weeks they had become a team. Her team. Her kids. It's cold for walking. Nell jolted tensed, then laughed at herself when she saw Max step away from the shadow of a tree in his sister's yard. Lord, you gave me a start. I nearly went into my repel-the-mugger stance. Taylor's Grove's a little sparse when it comes to muggers. Are you going to see Mira? No, actually, I was just out walking. Too much energy to stay in. The smile lit her face. You've heard the good news? Congratulations. It's not me. Yeah, it is. A lot of it. It was the only way he knew to tell her how proud he was of what she'd done. He glanced back toward the house where lights gleamed. Mira and Kim are in there crying. Crying? But not that kind of crying. Female tears always embarrassed him. He shrugged. You know, the other kind. Oh. In response, Nell felt her own eyes sting. That's nice. Dave's going around with a big fat grin on his face. He was talking to his parents when I ducked out. Mira's already called ours, as well as every other friend and relative in the country. Well, it's a big deal. I know it is. His teeth flashed. I've made a few calls myself. You must be feeling pretty pleased with yourself. You bet I am. Seeing the kids today when I made the announcement, well, it was the best. And it's a hell of a kickoff for our fundraiser. She shivered as the wind shuddered through the trees. You're getting cold. I'll drive you home. That'd be nice. I keep waiting for snow. In the way of every countryman since Adam, he sniffed the air, checked out the sky. You won't have to wait much longer. He opened the truck door for her. The kids have already gotten their sleds out. I might buy one for myself. She settled back, relaxed. Where are the boys? There's a sleepover at one of their friends. He gestured toward the house across the street from Mira's. I just dropped them off. They must be thinking a lot about Christmas now with snow in the air. It's funny. 
Usually, right after Halloween, they start barraging me with lists and pictures of toys from catalogs, stuff they see on TV. He turned the truck and headed for the square. This year, they told me Santa's taking care of it. I know they want bikes. His brow creased. That's all I've heard. They've been whispering together about something else, but they clam up when I come around. That's Christmas, Nell said easily. It's the best time for whispers and secrets. What about you? She turned to smile at him. What do you want for Christmas? More than the two hours sleep I usually get. You can do better than that. When the kids come downstairs in the morning and their faces light up, I've got all I want. He stopped in front of her apartment. Are you going back to New York for the holiday? No, there's nothing there. Your family? I'm an only child. My parents usually spend the holiday in the Caribbean. Do you want to come in, have some coffee? It was a much more appealing idea than going home to an empty house. Yeah, thanks. When they started up the stairs, he tried to swing tactfully back to the holidays and her family. Is that where you spent Christmas as a kid, in the Caribbean? No. We had a fairly traditional setting in Philadelphia. Then I went to school in New York, and they moved to Florida. She opened the door and took off her coat. We aren't very close, really. They weren't terribly happy with my decision to study music. Oh. He tossed his jacket over hers while she moved into the kitchen to put on the coffee. I guess that's why you got so steamed about Junior. Maybe. They didn't really disapprove so much as they were baffled. We get along much better long distance. She glanced over her shoulder. I think that's why I admire you. He stopped studying the rosewood music box on a table and stared at her. Me? Your interest and involvement with your children, your whole family, it's so solid, so natural. Tossing back her hair, she reached into the cookie jar and began to spread cookies on a plate. Not everyone is as willing or as able to put in so much time and attention. Not everyone loves as well or as thoroughly. She smiled. Now I've embarrassed you. No. Yes, he admitted and took one of the cookies. You haven't asked about their mother. When she said nothing, Mac found himself talking. I was just out of college when I met her. She was a secretary in my father's real estate office. She was beautiful. I mean, eye-popping beautiful. The kind that bowls you over. We went out a couple of times. We went to bed. She got pregnant. The flat-voiced recitation had Nell looking up. Matt bit into the cookie, tasting bitterness. I know that sounds like she did it on her own. I was young, but I was old enough to know what I was doing, old enough to be responsible. He had always taken his responsibilities seriously, Nell thought, and he always would. You only had to look at him to see the dependability. You didn't say anything about love. No, I didn't. It was something he didn't take lightly. I was attracted. So was she, or... I thought she was. What I didn't know was that she'd lied about using birth control. It wasn't until after I'd married her that I found out she'd set out to snag the boss's son. Her words, he added. Angie saw an opportunity to improve her standard of living. It surprised him that even now, after all this time, it hurt both pride and heart to know he'd been so carelessly used. To make a long story short, he continued in that same expressionless tone, she hadn't counted on twins or the hassle of motherhood. So about a month after the boys were born, she cleaned out my bank account and split. I'm so sorry, Mac, Nell murmured. She wished she knew the words, the gesture that would erase the cool dispassion from his eyes. It must have been horrible for you. It could have been worse. His eyes met Nell's briefly before he shrugged it off. I could have loved her. She contacted me once, telling me she wanted me to foot the bill for the divorce. In exchange for that, I could have the kids free and clear. <laughs> free and clear, he repeated, as if they were stocks and bonds instead of children. 
I took her up on it. End of story. Is it? Nell moved to him, took his hands in hers. Even if you didn't love her, she hurt you. She rose on her toes to kiss his cheek, to soothe, to comfort. She saw the change in his eyes, and, yes, the hurt in them. It explained a great deal, she thought, to hear him tell the story, to see his face as he did. He'd been disillusioned, devastated. Instead of giving in to it or leaning on his parents for help with the burden, he'd taken his sons and started a life with them, a life for them. She didn't deserve you or the boys. It wasn't a hardship. He couldn't take his eyes off hers now. It wasn't the sympathy so much as the simple, unquestioning understanding that pulled at him. They're the best part of me. I didn't mean it to sound like it was a sacrifice. You didn't. You don't. Her heart melted as she slid her arms around him. She'd meant that, too, as a comfort. But something more, something deeper, was stirring inside her. You made it sound as if you love them. It's very appealing to hear a man say that he thinks of his children as a gift, and to know he means it. He was holding her, and he wasn't quite sure how it had happened. It seemed so easy, so natural to have her settled in his arms. When you're given a gift, an important one, you have to be careful with it. His voice thickened with a mix of emotions. His children? Her? Something about the way she was looking up at him, the way her lips curved. He lifted a hand to stroke her hair, lingered over it a moment before he remembered to back away. I should go. Stay. It was so easy, she discovered, to ask him. So easy, after all, to need him. You know I want you to stay. You know I want you. He couldn't take his eyes off her face, and the need was so much bigger, so much sweeter than he'd ever imagined. It could complicate things, Nell. I've got a lot of baggage. Most of it's in storage, but I don't care. Her breath trembled out. I don't even have any pride at the moment. Make love with me, Mac. On a sigh, she pulled his head down and pressed her lips to his. Just love me tonight. He couldn't resist. It was a fantasy that had begun to wind through him, body and mind, the moment he first met her. She was all softness, all warmth. He'd done without both of those miraculous female gifts for so long. Now, with her mouth on his and her arms twined around him, she was all he could want. He'd never considered himself romantic. He wondered if a woman like Nell would prefer candlelight, soft music, perfumed air. But the scene was already set. He could do nothing more than lift her into his arms and carry her to the bedroom. He turned on a lamp, surprised at how suddenly his nerves vanished when he saw hers reflected in her eyes. I've thought about this a long time, he told her. I want to see you every minute I'm touching you. I want to see you. Good. She looked up at him and his smile soothed away some of her tension. I want to see you. He carried her to the bed and lay down beside her, stroking a hand through her hair, over her shoulders. Then he dipped his head to kiss her. It was so easy, as if they had shared nights and intimacy for years. It was so thrilling, as if each of them had come to the bed as innocent as a babe. A touch, a taste, patient and lingering. A murmur, a sigh, soft and quiet. His hands never rushed, only pleasured, stroking over her, unfastening buttons, pausing to explore. Her skin quivered under his caress even as it heated. A hundred pulse points thrummed, speeding at the brush of a fingertip, the flick of a tongue. Her own hands trembled, pulling a laughing groan from her that ended on a broken whimper when she at last found flesh. Making love. The phrase had never been truer to her. 
for here was an exquisite tenderness mixed with a lustful curiosity that overpowered the senses, tangled in the system like silken knots. Each time his mouth returned to hers it went deeper, wider, higher, so that he was all that existed for her, all that needed to. She gave with a depthless generosity that staggered him. She fit body to body with him with a perfection that thrilled. Each time he thought his control would slip, he found himself sliding easily back into the rhythm they set. Slow, subtle, savoring. She was small, delicately built. The fragility he sensed made his hands all the more tender. Even as she arched and cried out the first time, he didn't hurry. It was gloriously arousing for him simply to watch her face, that incredibly expressive face, as every emotion played over it. He fought back the need to bury himself inside her, clung to control long enough to protect them both. Their eyes locked when at last he slipped into her. Her breath caught and released, and then her lips curved. Outside, the wind played against the windows, making a music like sleigh bells, and the first snow of the season began to fall as quietly as a wish. This is the end of disc number two. Please insert disc number three. This is disc number three. Outside, the wind played against the windows, making a music like sleigh bells, and the first snow of the season began to fall as quietly as a wish. Chapter 8 He couldn't get enough of her. Mac figured at worst it was a kind of insanity, at best, a temporary obsession. No matter how many demands there were on his time, his brain, his emotions, he still found odd moments, day and night, to think about Nell. Though he knew it was cynical, he wished it could have been just sex. If it was only sex, he could put it down to hormones and get back to business. But he didn't just imagine her in bed, or fantasize about finding an hour to lose himself in that trim little body. Sometimes, when she slipped into his head, she was standing in front of a group of children, directing their voices with her hands, her arms, her whole self. Or she'd be seated at the piano, with his boys on either side of her, laughing with them. Or she'd just be walking through town with her hands in her pockets and her face lifted toward the sky. She scared him right down to the bone. And she, he thought as he measured his baseboard trim, she was so easy about the whole thing. That was a woman for you, he decided. They didn't have to worry about making the right moves, saying the right thing. They just had to... to be, he thought. That was enough to drive a man crazy. He couldn't afford to be crazy. He had kids to raise, a business to run. Hell, he had laundry to do if he ever got home, and... Damn it! He'd forgotten to take the chicken out of the freezer again. They'd catch burgers on the way to the concert, he told himself. He had enough on his mind without having to fix dinner. Christmas was barreling toward him, and the kids were acting... strange. Just the bikes, Dad, they told him. Santa's making them, and he's taking care of the big present. What big present? Mac wondered. No interrogation, no tricks had pulled out that particular answer. For once, his kids were closed up tight. That was an idea that disturbed him. He knew that in another year, two if he was lucky, they'd begin to question and doubt the existence of Santa and magic. The end of innocence. Whatever it was they were counting on for Christmas morning, he wanted to see that they found it under the tree. But they just grinned at him when he prodded and told him it was a surprise for all three of them. He'd have to work on it. Mac hammered the trim into place. At least they'd gotten the tree up and baked some cookies, strung the popcorn. 
He felt a little twinge of guilt over the fact that he'd evaded Nell's offer to help with the decorating, and ignored the kids when they asked if she could come over and trim the tree with them. Was he the only one who could see what a mistake it would be to have his children become too attached? She'd only been in town for a few months. She could leave at any time. Nell might find them cute, attractive kids, but she didn't have any investment in them. Damn it, now he was making them sound like stocks and bonds. It wasn't what he meant, Mac assured himself. He simply wasn't going to allow anyone to walk out on his sons again. He wouldn't risk it, not for anything in heaven or on earth. After nailing the last piece of baseboard in place, he nodded in approval. The house was coming together just fine. He knew what he was doing there, just as he knew what he was doing with the boys. He only wished he had a better idea of what to do with Nell. Maybe it'll happen tonight. Zeke watched his breath puff out like smoke as he and his twin sat in the treehouse, wrapped against the December chill in coats and scarves. It's not Christmas yet. But it's the Christmas concert, Zeke said stubbornly. He was tired of waiting for the mom. That's where we saw her first, and they'll have the music and the tree and stuff, so it'll be like Christmas. I don't know. Zack liked the idea, a lot, but was more cautious. Maybe, but we don't get any presents until Christmas. We do, too. When Mr. Perkins pretends to be Santa at the party at the firehouse. That's whole weeks before Christmas, and he gives all the kids presents. Not real presents. Not stuff you ask for. But Zack set his mind to it. Maybe if we wish real hard. Dad likes her a lot. Aunt Mira was telling Uncle Dave that Dad's found the right woman even if he doesn't know it. Zack's brow creased. How could he not know it if he found her? Aunt Mira's always saying stuff that doesn't make sense, Zeke said with the easy disdain of the young. Dad's going to marry her and she's going to come live with us and be the mom. She has to be. We've been good, haven't we? Uh-huh. Zack played with the toe of his boot. Do you think she'll love us and all that? Probably. Zeke shot his twin a look. I love her already. Me too. Zack smiled in relief. Everything was going to be okay after all. All right, people. Nell pitched her voice above the din in the chorus room. It doubled as backstage on concert nights, and students were swarming around, checking clothes, makeup, and hair, working off pre-performance jitters by talking at the top of their lungs. Settle down! One of her students had his head between his knees, fighting off acute stage fright. Nell sent him a sympathetic smile as her group began to quiet. You've all worked really hard for tonight. I know a lot of you are jumpy because you have friends and family out in the audience. Use the nerves to sharpen your performance. Please try to remember to go out on stage in the organized, dignified manner we've practiced. There were some snickers at that. Nell merely lifted a brow. I should have said remember to be more dignified and more orderly than you've managed at practice. Diaphragms, she said. Projection. Posture. Smiles. She paused, lifted a hand. And above all, I expect you to remember the most vital ingredient in tonight's performance. Enjoy it, she said and grinned. It's Christmas. Now let's go knock em dead. Her heart was doing some pretty fancy pumping of its own as she directed the children on stage, watched them take their positions on the risers as the murmurs from the audience rose and ebbed. For many, Nell knew this concert would be her first test. Decisions from the community would be made tonight as to whether the school board had made a good or a bad choice in their new music teacher. She took a deep breath, tugged at the hem of her velvet jacket, and stepped on stage. There was polite applause as she approached the solo mic. Welcome to Taylor's Grove High School's holiday concert, she began. Gosh, Dad. Doesn't Miss Davis look pretty? Yeah, Zach, she does. Lovely was more the word, he thought, in that soft-looking, deep forest green suit with holly berries in her hair and a quick, 
nervous smile on her face. She looked terrific in the spotlight. He wondered if she knew it. At the moment, all Nell knew was nerves. She wished she could see faces clearly. She'd always preferred seeing her audience when she was performing. It made it more intimate, more fun. After her announcement, she turned, saw every student's eyes on hers, then smiled in reassurance. Okay, kids, she murmured in an undertone only they could hear. Let's rock. She started them off with a bang, the Springsteen number, and it had eyes popping wide in the audience. This was not the usual yawn-inspiring program most had been expecting. When the applause hit, Nell felt the tension dissolve. They'd crossed the first hurdle. She segued from the fun to the traditional, thrilled when the auditorium filled with the harmony on Cantate Domino, delighted when her sopranos soared on Adeste Fidelis, grinning when they bounced into Jingle Bell Rock, complete with the little stage business of swaying and hand-clapping they'd worked on. And her heart swelled when Kim approached the mic and the first pure notes of her solo flowed into the air. Oh, Dave! Sniffling, Mira clutched at her husband's hand, then Max. Our baby! Nell's prediction had been on target. When Kim stepped back in position, there were damp eyes in every row. They closed the concert with Silent Night, only voices, no piano, the way it was meant to be sung, Nell had told her students, the way it was written to be sung. When the last note died and she turned to gesture to her chorus, the audience was already on its feet. The kick of it jolted through her as she turned her head, saw the slack jaws, wide eyes, and foolish grins of her students. Nell swallowed tears, waiting until the noise abated slightly, before crossing to the mic again. She knew how to play it. They were terrific, weren't they? As she'd hoped, that started the cheers and applause all over again. She waited it out. I'd like to thank you all for coming, for supporting the chorus. I owe a special thanks to the parents of the singers on stage tonight for their patience, their understanding, and their willingness to let me share their children for a few hours every day. Every student on stage has worked tremendously hard for tonight, and I'm delighted that you appreciate their talent and their effort. I'd like to add that the poinsettias you see on stage were donated by Hill Florists and are for sale at $3 a pot. Proceeds to go to the fund for new choir uniforms. Merry Christmas and come back! Before she could step away from the mic, Kim and Brad were standing on either side of her. There's just one more thing. Brad cleared his throat until the rustling in the audience died down. The chorus would like to present a token of appreciation to Miss Davis for all her work and encouragement. Uh, Kim had written the speech out, but Brad had been designated to say it. He fumbled a little, grinned self-consciously at Kim. This is Miss Davis's first concert at Taylor High. Uh, he just couldn't remember all the nice words Kim had written, so he said what he felt. She's the best. Thanks, Miss Davis. We hope you like it, Kim murmured under the applause as she handed Nell a brightly wrapped box. All the kids chipped in. I'm... She didn't know what to say, was afraid to try. When she opened the box, she stared misty-eyed down at a pin shaped like a treble clef. We know you like jewelry, Kim began, so we thought, it's beautiful, it's perfect. Taking a steady breath, she turned to the chorus. Thanks. It means almost as much to me as you do. Merry Christmas. She got a present, Zack pointed out. They were waiting in the crowded corridor outside the auditorium to congratulate Kim. That means we could get one tonight. We could get her. Not if she goes home right after. Zack had already worked this out. He was waiting for his moment. When he saw her, he pounced. Miss Davis! Over here, Miss Davis! Mac didn't move. Couldn't. Something had happened while he sat three rows back watching her on the stage. Seeing her smile, seeing tears in her eyes, just seeing her. He was in love with her. 
It was nothing he'd ever experienced, nothing he knew how to handle. Running seemed the smartest solution, but he didn't think he could move. Hi! She crouched down for hugs, squeezing the boys tight, kissing each cheek. Did you like the concert? It was real good. Kim was the best. Nell leaned close to Zeke's ear. I think so, too, but it has to be a secret. We're good at keeping secrets. He smiled smugly at his brother. We've had one for weeks and weeks. Can you come to our house now, Miss Davis? Zack clung to her hand and put all his charm into his eyes. Please, come see our tree and the lights. We put lights everywhere so you can see them from all the way down the road. I'd like that. Testing the water, she glanced up at Mac. But your dad might be tired. He wasn't tired. He was flattened. Her lashes were still damp, and the little pin the kids had given her glinted against her velvet jacket. You're welcome to come out if you don't mind the drive. I'd like it. I'm still wired up. She straightened, searching for some sign of welcome or rebuff in Mac's face. If you're sure it isn't a bad time. No. His tongue was thick, he realized, as if he'd been drinking. I want to talk to you. I'll head out as soon as I'm finished here, then. She winked at the boys and melted back into the crowd. She's done wonders with those kids, Mrs. Hollis nodded to Mac. It'll be a shame to lose her. Lose her? Mac glanced down at his boys, but they were already in a huddle exchanging whispers. What do you mean? I heard from Mr. Perkins, who got it from Addie McVie at the high school office, that Nell Davis was offered her old position back at that New York school starting next fall. Nell and the principal had themselves a conference just this morning. Mrs. Hollis babbled on as Max stared blankly over her head. Hate to think about her leaving us. Made a difference with these kids. She spied one of her gossip buddies and elbowed her way through the crowd. Chapter 9 Control came easily to Mac, or at least it had for the past seven years. He used all the control at his disposal to keep his foul mood and bubbling temper from the boys. They were so excited about her coming, he thought bitterly, wanted to make certain all the lights were lit, the cookies were out, the decorative bell was hung on Zark's collar. They were in love with her too, he realized, and that made it a hell of a mess. He should have known better. He had known better. Somehow he'd let it happen anyway. Let himself slip. Let himself fall. And he dragged his kids along with him. Well, he'd have to fix it, wouldn't he? Mac got himself a beer, tipped the bottle back. He was good at fixing things. Ladies like wine, Zack informed him, like Aunt Mira does. He remembered Nell had sipped white wine at Mira's party. I don't have any, he muttered. Because his father looked unhappy, Zack hugged Mac's leg. You can buy some before she comes over next time. Reaching down, Mac cupped his son's upturned face. The love was so strong, so vital, Mac could all but feel it grip him by the throat. Always got an answer, don't you, pal? You like her, don't you, Dad? Yeah, she's nice. And she likes us too, right? Hey, who wouldn't like the Taylor guys? He sat at the kitchen table, pulled Zack into his lap. He'd discovered when his sons were infants that there was nothing more magical than holding your own child. Most of the time, I even like you. That made Zack giggle and cuddle closer. She has to live all by herself, though. Zack began to play with the buttons of his father's shirt, a sure sign Mac knew that he was leading up to something. Lots of people live alone. We've got a big house and two whole rooms nobody sleeps in except when Grandma and Pop come to visit. His radar was humming. Mac tugged on his son's ear. Zack, what are you getting at? 
Nothing. Lip poked out, Zack toyed with another button. I was just wondering what it would be like if she came and lived here. He peeked up under his lashes. So she wouldn't be lonely. Nobody said she was lonely, Mac pointed out. And I think you should... The doorbell rang, sending the dog into a fit of excited barking and jingling. Zeke flew into the kitchen, dancing from foot to foot. She's here! She's here! I got the picture. Mac ruffled Zack's hair, set him on his feet. Well, let her in. It's cold out. I'll do it. I'll do it. The twins had a fierce race through the house to the front door. They hit it together, fought over the knob, then all but dragged Nell over the threshold once they'd yanked the door open. You took so long, Zeke complained. We've been waiting forever. I put on Christmas music, here, and we've got the tree lit and everything. <laughs> so I see. It was a lovely room, one she tried not to resent having only now been invited into. She knew Mac had built most of the house himself. He'd told her that much. He'd created an open, homey space with lots of wood, a glass-fronted fireplace where stockings were already hung. The tree, a six-foot blue spruce, was wildly decorated and placed with pride in front of the wide front window. It's terrific! Letting the boys pull her along, Nell crossed over to give the tree a closer look. Really wonderful! It makes the little one in my apartment look scrawny. You can share ours. Zack looked up at her, his heart in his eyes. We can get you a stocking and everything and have your name put on it. They do it at the mall, Zeke told her. We'll get you a big one. Now they were pulling at her heart as well as her hands. Filled with the emotion of the moment, she crouched down to hug them to her. You guys are the best. She laughed as Zark pushed in for attention. You too. Her arms full of kids and dogs, she looked up to smile at Mac as he stepped in from the kitchen. Hi. Sorry I took so long. Some of the kids hung around wanting to go over every mistake and triumph of the concert. She shouldn't look so right, so perfect, snuggling his boys under the tree. I didn't hear any mistakes. They were there, but we'll work on them. She scooted back, sitting on a hassock and taking both boys with her. As if, Mac thought, she meant to keep them. We don't have any wine, Zack informed her solemnly. But we have milk and juice and sodas and beer, lots of other things. Or... He cast a crafty look in his father's direction. Somebody could make hot cocoa. One of my specialties. Nell stood to shrug out of her coat. Where's the kitchen? I'll make it, Mac muttered. I'll help. Baffled by his sudden distance, she walked to him. Or don't you like women in your kitchen? We don't get many around here. You looked good up on stage. Thanks. It felt good being there. He looked past her into the wide, anticipation-filled eyes of his children. Why don't you two go change into your pajamas? The cocoa will be finished by the time you are. We'll be faster. Zeke vowed and shot toward the stairs. Only if you throw your clothes on the floor and don't. He turned back into the kitchen. Will they hang them up or push them under the bed? Nell asked. Zack will hang them up and they'll fall on the floor. Zeke will push them under the bed. She laughed, watching him get out milk and cocoa. I meant to tell you. A few days ago they came in with Kim to rehearsal. They'd switched sweaters, you know, the color code. I really impressed them when I knew who was who anyway. He paused in the act of measuring Coco into a pan. How did you? I guess I didn't think about it. They're each their own person. Facial expressions. You know how Zeke's eyes narrow and Zack looks under his lashes when they're pleased about something? Inflection in the voice. She opened a cupboard at random looking for mugs. Posture. There are all sorts of little clues if you pay attention and look closely enough. Ah, found them. Pleased with herself, she took out four mugs and set them on the counter. She tilted her head when she saw him studying her. Analytically, she thought. As if she were something to be measured and fit into place. 
Is something wrong? I wanted to talk to you. He busied himself with heating the cocoa. So you said. She found she needed to steady herself with a hand on the counter. Mac, am I misreading something or are you pulling back? I don't know that I'd call it that. Something was going to hurt. Nell braced for it. What would you call it? She said as calmly as she could. I'm a little concerned about the boys, about the fallout when you move on. They're getting too involved. Why did that sound so stupid, he wondered. Why did he feel so stupid? They are? I think we've been sending the wrong signals, and it would be best for them if we backed off. He concentrated on the cocoa as if it were a nuclear experiment. We've gone out a few times, and we've... Slept together, she finished, cool now. It was the last defense. He looked around sharply, but he could still hear the stomping of little feet in the room overhead. Yeah, we've slept together, and it was great. The thing is, kids pick up on more things than most people think, and they get ideas. They get attached. And you don't want them to get attached to me. Yes, she realized, it was going to hurt. You don't want to get attached. I just think it would be a mistake to take it any further. Clear enough. The no trespassing signs are back up and I'm out. It's not like that, Nell. He set the spoon down, took a step toward her, but there was a line he couldn't quite cross, a line he'd created himself. If he didn't make certain they both stayed on their own sides of it, the life he'd so carefully built could crumble. I've got things under control here, and I need to keep them that way. I'm all they've got. They're all I've got. I can't mess that up. No explanations necessary. Her voice had thickened. In a moment, she knew it would begin to shake. You made it clear from the beginning. Crystal clear. Funny, the first time you invite me into your home, it's to toss me out. I'm not tossing you out. I'm trying to realign things. Oh, go to hell! And keep your realignments for your houses! She sprinted out of the kitchen. Nell, don't go like this! But by the time he reached the living room, she was grabbing her coat, and his boys were racing down the stairs. Where are you going, Miss Davis? You haven't... Both boys stopped, shocked by the tears streaming down her face. I'm sorry... It was too late to hide them, so she kept heading for the door. I have to do something. I'm sorry. And she was gone, with Max standing impotently in the living room and both boys staring at him. A dozen excuses spun around in his head. Even as he tried to grab one, Zack burst into tears. She went away. You made her cry and she went away. I didn't mean to. She... He moved to gather his sons up and was met with a solid wall of resistance. You ruined everything! A tear spilled out of Zeke's eyes, heated by temper. We did everything we were supposed to and you ruined it! She'll never come back! Zack sat on the bottom step and sobbed. She'll never be the mom now! What? At his wit's end, Mac dragged his hand through his hair. What are you two talking about? You ruined it, Zeke said again. Look, Miss Davis and I had a disagreement. People have disagreements. It's not the end of the world. He wished it didn't feel like the end of his world. Santa sent her. Zack rubbed his eyes with his fists. He sent her just like we asked him, and now she's gone. What do you mean, Santa sent her? Determined, Max sat on the steps. He pulled a reluctant Zack into his lap and tugged Zeke down to join them. Miss Davis came from New York to teach music, not from the North Pole. We know that! Temper set aside, Zeke sought comfort, turning his face into his father's chest. She came because we sent Santa a letter months and months ago, so we'd be early and he'd have time. Have time for what? To pick out the mom. On a shuddering sigh, Zack sniffed and looked up at his father. We wanted someone nice, who smelled good and liked dogs and had yellow hair. And we asked and she came. 
And you were supposed to marry her and make her the mom. Mac let out a long breath and prayed for wisdom. Why didn't you tell me you were thinking about having a mother? Not a mom, Zeke told him. The mom. Miss Davis is the mom. But she's gone now. We love her and she won't like us anymore because you made her cry. Of course she'll still like you. She'd hate him, but she wouldn't take it out on the boys. But you two are old enough to know you don't get moms from Santa. He sent her, just like we asked him. We didn't ask for anything else but the bikes. Zack burrowed into his lap. We didn't ask for any toys or any games, just the mom. Make her come back, Dad. Fix it. You always fix it. It doesn't work like that, pal. People aren't broken toys or old houses. Santa didn't send her. She moved here for a job. He did, too, send her. With surprising dignity, Zack pushed off his father's lap. Maybe you don't want her, but we do. His sons walked up the stairs, a united front that closed him out. Mac was left with emptiness in the pit of his stomach and the smell of burned cocoa. Chapter 10 She should get out of town for a few days, Nell thought. Go somewhere. Go anywhere. There was nothing more pathetic than sitting alone on Christmas Eve and watching other people bustle along the street outside your window. She'd turned down every holiday party invitation, made excuses that sounded hollow even to her. She was brooding, she admitted, and it was entirely unlike her. But then again, she'd never had a broken heart to nurse before. With Bob, it had been wounded pride, and that had healed itself with embarrassing speed. Now she was left with bleeding emotions at the time of year when love was most important. She missed him. Oh, she hated to know that she missed him. That slow, hesitant smile, the quiet voice, the gentleness of him. In New York, at least, she could have lost herself in the crowds, in the rush. But here, everywhere she looked was another reminder. Go somewhere, Nell. Just get in the car and drive. She ached to see the children, wondered if they'd taken their sleds out in the fresh snow that had fallen yesterday. Were they counting the hours until Christmas, plotting to stay awake until they heard reindeer on the roof? She had presents for them, wrapped and under her tree. She'd send them via Kim or Mira, she thought, and was miserable all over again because she wouldn't see their faces as they tore off the wrappings. They're not your children, she reminded herself. On that point, Mac had always been clear. Sharing himself had been difficult enough. Sharing his children had stopped him dead. She would go away, she decided, and forced herself to move. She would pack a bag, toss it in the car, and drive until she felt like stopping. She'd take a couple of days, 
Hell, she'd take a week. She couldn't bear to stay here alone through the holidays. For the next ten minutes, she tossed things into a suitcase without any plan or sense of order. Now that the decision was made, she only wanted to move quickly. She closed the lid on the suitcase, carried it into the living room, and started for her coat. The knock on her door had her clenching her teeth. If one more well-meaning neighbor stopped by to wish her Merry Christmas and invite her to dinner, she was going to scream. She opened the door and felt the fresh wound stab through her. Well, Macaulay, out wishing your tenants happy holidays? Can I come in? Why? Nell. There was a wealth of patience in the word. Please, let me come in. Fine, you own the place. She turned her back on him. Sorry I haven't any wassail and I'm very low on good cheer. I need to talk to you. He'd been trying to find the right way and the right words for days. Really? Excuse me if I don't welcome it. The last time you needed to talk to me is still firmly etched in my mind. I didn't mean to make you cry. I cry easily. You should see me after a greeting card commercial on TV. She couldn't keep up the snide comments, and she gave in, asking the question that was uppermost in her mind. How are the kids? Barely speaking to me. At her blank look, he gestured toward the couch. Will you sit down? This is kind of a complicated story. I'll stand. I don't have a lot of time, actually. I was just leaving. His gaze followed hers and landed on the suitcase. His mouth tightened. Well, it didn't take long. What didn't? I guess you took them up on that offer to teach back in New York. Word does travel. No, I didn't take them up. I like my job here. I like the people here, and I intend to stay. I'm just going on a holiday. You're going on a holiday at five o'clock on Christmas Eve? I can come and go as I please. No, don't take off your coat, she snapped. Tears were threatening. Just say your piece and get out. I still pay the rent here. On second thought, just leave now. Damn it, you're not going to make me cry again. The boys think Santa sent you. Excuse me? As the first tear spilled over, he moved to her, brushed it away with his thumb. Don't cry, Nell. I hate knowing I made you cry. Don't touch me. She whirled away and fumbled a tissue out of the box. He was discovering exactly how it felt to be sliced in two. I'm sorry. Slowly he lowered his hand to his side. I know how you must feel about me now. You don't know the half of it. She blew her nose, struggled for control. What's this about the boys and Santa? They wrote a letter back in the fall, not long before they met you. They decided they wanted a mom for Christmas. Not a mom, Mac explained as she turned back to stare at him. The mom. They kept correcting me on that one. They had pretty specific ideas about what they wanted. She was supposed to have yellow hair and smile a lot, like kids and dogs and bake cookies. They wanted bikes, too, but that was sort of an afterthought. All they really wanted was the mom. Oh. She did sit now, lowering herself onto the arm of the sofa. That explains a couple of things. Steadying herself, she looked back at him. Put you in quite a spot, didn't it? I know you love them, Mac, but starting a relationship with me to try to please your children takes things beyond parental devotion. I didn't know. Damn it, do you think I'd play with their feelings or yours that way? Not theirs, she said hollowly. Certainly not theirs. He remembered how delicate she had seemed when they made love. There was more fragility now. No roses in her cheeks, he saw with a pang of distress. No light in her eyes. I know what it's like to be hurt, Nell. I never would have hurt you deliberately. They didn't tell me about the letter until the night. You weren't the only one I made cry that night. I tried to explain that Santa doesn't work that way, but they've got it fixed in their heads that he sent you. 
I'll talk to them if you want me to. I don't deserve, not for you, she said, for them. He nodded, accepting. I wondered how it would make you feel to know they wished for you. Don't push me, Mac. He couldn't help it, and he kept his eyes on hers as they moved closer. They wished for you for me, too. That's why they didn't tell me. You were our Christmas present. He reached down, touched her hair. How does that make you feel? How do you think I feel? She batted his hand away and rose to face the window. It hurts. I fell in love with the three of you almost from the first glance, and it hurts. Go away. Leave me alone. Somehow a fist had crept into his chest and was squeezing at his heart. I thought you'd go away. I thought you'd leave us alone. I wouldn't let myself believe you cared enough to stay. Then you were an idiot, she mumbled. I was clumsy. He watched the tiny lights on her tree shining in her hair and gave up any thought of saving himself. All right, I was an idiot. The worst kind, because I kept hiding from what you might feel, from what I felt. I didn't fall in love with you right away. At least, I didn't know it. Not until the night of the concert. I wanted to tell you. I didn't know how to tell you. Then I heard something about the New York offer, and it was the perfect excuse to push you out. I thought I was protecting the kids from getting hurt. No, he wouldn't use them, he thought in disgust, not even to get her back. That was only part of it. I was protecting myself. I couldn't control the way I felt about you. It scared me. Now is no different from then, Mac. It could be different. He took a chance and laid his hands on her shoulders, turned her to face him. It took my own sons to show me that sometimes you've just got to wish. Don't leave me, Nell. Don't leave us. I was never going anywhere. Forgive me. She started to turn her head away, but he cupped her cheek, held it gently. Please. Maybe I can't fix this, but... Give me a chance to try. I need you in my life. We need you. There was such patience in his voice, such quiet strength in the hand on her face. Even as she looked at him, her heart began to heal. I love you. All of you. I can't help it. Relief and gratitude flavored the kiss as he touched his lips to hers. I love you. I don't want to help it. Drawing her close, he cradled her head on his shoulder. It's just been the three of us for so long, I didn't know how to make room. I think I'm figuring it out. He eased her away again and reached into his coat pocket. I bought you a present. Mac. Still staggering from the roller coaster emotions, she rubbed her hands over her damp cheeks. It isn't Christmas yet. Close enough. I think if you'd open it now, I'd stop having all this tightness in my chest. All right. She dashed another tear aside. We'll consider it a peace offering, then. I may even decide to... She trailed off when the box was opened in her hand. A ring. The traditional single diamond crowning a gold band. Marry me, Nell, he said quietly. Be the mom. She raised dazzled eyes to him. You move awfully quickly for someone who always seems to take his time. Christmas Eve. He watched her face as he took the ring out of the box. It seemed like the night to push my luck. It was a good choice. Smiling, she held out her hand. A very good choice. When the ring was on her finger, she lifted her hand to his cheek. When? He should have known it would be simple. With her, it would always be simple. New Year's Eve's only a week away. It would be a good start to a new year, a new life. Yes. Will you come home with me tonight? I left the kids at Mira's. We could pick them up and you'd spend Christmas where you belong. 
Before she could answer, he smiled and kissed her hand. You're already packed. So I am. It must be magic. I'm beginning to believe it. He framed her face with his hands, lowered his mouth for a long, lingering kiss. Maybe I didn't wish for you, but you're all I want for Christmas, Nell. He rubbed his cheek over her hair, looked out at the colored lights gleaming on the houses below. Did you hear something? He murmured. Hmm. She held him close, smiled. Sleigh bells.